Hey guys, this is Frank Yetter, and you're listening to Submission Radio. Hey, this is Rich Franklin. What's up, everybody? This is Chris Lieben. This is Diego Sanchez. Randy Couture. Alice Overing. Hi, this is Stephen Bonner. This is Don Fry. Hey, I'm Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. TJ Dillashaw. And you're listening to Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. You're listening to Submission Radio. Welcome to Submission Radio, episode 112. This is Wednesday, the 25th of January. Dennis Gratov here with Kasper Rosalowski after a big Bellator weekend and a lot of crazy things happening in the headlines, as always, in the world of MMA. So much to talk about, so much to discuss, and so many people to talk to as well. We have a sexy, sexy, juicy lineup this week for you. Who have we got? You want to know? I'll tell you who. Johnny Hendricks, in his first interview since UFC 207. A rough night, a rough month for Johnny Hendricks. We have him on the program to discuss a lot of things. He's moving to middleweight. He's fighting Hector Lombard. So much to talk about. And uh, we've got the goods. Tito Ortiz, fresh off his victory over Chael Sonnen. The man just called it a career what an amazing career, and uh, you bet your ass we got the scoop. So Tito Ortiz is going to be joining us on the program. Al Iaquinta, a man who we haven't heard from in a long time. It's been a long, long time, even longer since we've had him on the program. But we miss Al, and uh, guess what? He's coming to our country. We want to get an update from him and talk shop. And so he'll be joining us on the program as well. I can't wait for that. And then Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Tyra Woodley was on the MMA Hour. We got Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. It's like yin and yang. We, we always love having Stephen on the show. And of course, his, there's so much to talk about with this fight, with obviously Tyra Woodley speaking about racism and things like that. There's so much to discuss. And uh, it, it doesn't end there. We've got more, don't we, Dennis? Yeah, that's right. Speaking of the racism chat that uh, Woodley's been speaking about this week, me and you will be giving our thoughts on it, sort of going through it and uh, giving our perspective on it. So I'm looking forward to sort of putting our thoughts to it and, and letting the listeners know what we think about it all and also joining us for the rest of the discussion segment is kareem zidane who's got a lot of stuff to talk about when it comes to russian mma and boy am i excited to have him on every time we have him on he gives us these crazy stories that you just cannot believe they're like straight out of the movies and he tells us that he's got some very very interesting stuff to talk about so can't wait to have him on plus We'll also give our thoughts on this whole Bellator 170 Chael San and Tito Ortiz fight if we thought it was a fix. Our thoughts on people saying it's a fix and also just our general thoughts on, on what this does for the company and, and Chael San's momentum. So lots of stuff to talk about. But before we sort of jump to it, just want to quickly remind everybody that this is your opportunity to follow us on Twitter at Submission AUS. Jump on Facebook and like us, Submission Radio AUS. And this is your opportunity to sort of message us and let us know your thoughts on the show. We love hearing your opinion. It's the start of 2017. So let's kick it off right. There's a lot of stuff that we talk about on this episode where we give our thoughts. But as always, we want to hear your comments. So whether it's down the YouTube section or through social media, make sure to jump on and give us your thoughts as soon as you're done listening to the episode. Yeah, while you're speaking about comments and feedback and all those kinds of things, don't forget, we are coming out on Wednesdays now in the US and Thursdays here in Australia. I feel like some people still haven't gotten the memo. And uh, if you feel like it, if you're feeling cheeky, if you're feeling naughty and spicy, uh, Mm -hmm. head down to iTunes where a lot of people listen to us and uh, give us a spicy review. You can give us however many stars you want. It's all about the spice this week, man. Spice (laughs) is like the word of of the day. Day. and uh, we've been getting some amazing ones and we, we we love checking them out we love reading them i actually don't have them in front of me now but i promise next week we'll be reading out some reviews so get them in and uh, and we'll be reading them out but without further ado enough rambling it's time to get the show on the road we get our first guest on the line a lot of people to speak to this week and uh dennis i believe you're going to be introducing him our next guest is a former welterweight champion after a tough outing at ufc 207 he has made the exciting decision to move up to the middleweight division fighting hector lombard at ufc fight night halifax the big rig has arrived to submission radio johnny hendrix welcome back to the program Hey, thank you for having me. No, thank you, Johnny. Thank you so much for coming back. Um, We've been wanting to chat to you for a while. Let's discuss this past month. Before we sort of get into the fighting, of course, you know, obviously it was, a, it was a difficult time for you with UFC 207 not going your way and you know, the issues with the weight cutting, but also when you're not fighting, you're a husband and a father. So tell us, once, once you were finally done with the fight, wh- what was that like? What was the last month like for you? What did you and the family do to relax and sort of take a load off over the holiday break? Uh, you know what? We really didn't take a break. I took a week off. Um, had to let my body reset. And that's one reason why I had to. Uh, you know, I, I, 
I, that's why I'm moving up the middle ways because, you know, cutting weight now is hard on my body. Mm. Um, it's getting difficult as you can tell for me to hit 170. I think it's just cause I've done it for so long. And after that, I was, I, you know, I told my coaches, I want to go 185. And, um, <clears throat> once, uh, once we made that decision, we sort of started trying to get another fight. Um, so there's really no break, uh, for me. Um, and you know, that's really what it's been like is, you know, going from one fight now that, you know, right now I'm at 200, I hit 196, uh, on, um, Friday. Mm. So, you know, the weight's not going to be an issue. And I think also, uh, with my fighting that I haven't really been able to fight to my best ability because the weight cuts been so difficult, uh, for me. Uh, and so that's really what the last month has been for me is sort of, you know, talking to the wife saying, Hey, uh, I want to move up. Um, uh, I know that obviously, you know, we don't want to see seventies anymore. I wish I could, you know, uh, I know that I'd have to do a huge lifestyle change, but I also know that with four kids, it's sort of hard to do that. Um, and you know, like I said, we started training again. We started doing things to get ready for the next, uh, next event that could possibly happen. Hmm. I'm just curious. I uh, just want to go back to that point where you sort of told the coaches that you want to move up to middleweight. I mean, it's been a, a, a point in contention for quite some time for yourself. A lot of people have spoken about it. What was that final moment that made you decide to move to middleweight? Can you explain that revelation that went through your head where you said, okay, that's it. I'm going to middleweight. Uh, yeah, well, you know what? It was uh, like my weight was going great. My weight was going great. I was going, dude, we're going to make weight easy. This is going to be, you know what I mean? Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, I hit 179. Uh, once I hit 179, I went up there. We did a workout usually that I normally do. Nothing crazy, but something that, uh, you know, something that I've been losing six pounds doing. Um, so I was like, you know what? Hey, we'll probably lose three. Since, you know, I'm getting a little lighter. Uh, and it was uh, not Thursday. It was Wednesday. Excuse me. <laughs> and uh, whenever I hit, <clears throat> excuse me whenever i hit on uh that wednesday i did what I, I you know i did it and i only lost a pound <laughs> and uh that's whenever things started going south for me um and that's whenever i realized uh you know what there's a time to listen to your body and there's a time not to and i've decided not to listen to it for the last year uh, I've wanted to move up to 85 for over a year now, but I still know that I can compete. I know wealth weight is a great thing. Right? Uh, now it's not because if I can't go out to perform, if I'm performing at my worst and I keep losing, well, what does that do for me? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that's just uh, a waste of camp and a waste of time you know, a waste of money for one. And, uh, I know I can still fight. And another thing that happened is when I went to OSU, I was wrestling these guys and they were like, how are you losing weight? And you still feel strong. Well, the next time I went up, I was close to 82. And they they pretty much said, you don't feel as strong now. Mm. Um, and once that happens, I'm going, okay. Now is really time for me to listen to my body and say, hey, <clears throat> something's got to give. I either got to retire, right, or I got to move up. And why not, you know, I got one fight left on my contract. Why not see what happens at 85? If I go out there and I feel strong and I feel good, and here's the thing. If I, you know, most of the fights in the last year, <clears throat> past the first round, I'm, I'm wondering if I have enough to get to the second and the third. Um, you know, and, and that's sort of where my body's been. Uh, it sucked, but it's just, like I said, something that I wanted to do. I still wanted to be a welterweight. Um, and like I said, now that I know, now that I missed weight twice in a row, I'm done with that. And what, what's worse is that I have performed that well. I, I, you know, I've been looking pretty, pretty bad. Um, even my last fight, you know, I thought I did enough to win. 
uh, it didn't go my way. So what, what do you do? You continue to beat your head against the wall or do you say, you know what, it's time to jump over it and jump over. It means go 185 and see how you do. You know, here's the thing. Worst case scenario is this is my last, you know, worst case scenario is my last fight. I fight. <clears throat> I don't, I still don't perform like I want to. Then guess what? <clears throat> I'm done. But if I go out there and I perform like I want to, and I can move like I want to and have the energy, then it, it's a great choice. Uh, not only that, but with the IVs, no IVs and all that kind of stuff, it, you know, you're seeing a lot of more people move up in weight class, mm-hmm. you know, uh, because they're not able to regain all their strength with, even though we're weighing in earlier <clears throat> to give us more time to hydrate, but it's still not going where it needs to go. Like, in our muscles and all the things to, to, to perform at our best. Yeah. I mean, th- th- there's sort of a lot to unpack there, Johnny. So I'll, I'll go with this one first. You said something interesting and that's that if, if the fight doesn't go your way, then you're done. This is something that you said last time. And it, it obviously a lot of people spoke about it, that if you, if you lose to Neil Magny, that you were going to retire. And you spoke about it at UFC 207, where that was kind of something you put out there because you were sick of the media always looking forward and looking past your fights and asking you about the title and GSP and all these these other fights. So how serious are you about you know this potential retirement that if, if, you, if things don't go well for you at middleweight in your next fight, really, that's the last really fight? Really, really serious. Really serious because, you know, realistically, I thought I won that fight. You know, mm-hmm. and I rewatch it and I rewatch it and I rewatch it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so in Vegas, you pressure somebody. <clears throat> you know, I've been pressured before and I've lost the fight. It's not that they outstruck me, it's because they're more aggressive than me. Right. Mm-hmm. I lose the fight. I get that. Okay. You work on that. <clears throat> then you go out there and you. You do this and you lose the fight. Well, this fight, I pretty much controlled him. What? What would you say? 20, 13 minutes. Mm. Let's be on the realistic side. I'd say about thirteen minutes of the fight. Mm-hmm. Uh, besides a minute of submission and fifteen seconds of a submission, which neither one, you know, it was going to get tight, but I made a slight adjustment and it went away. Um, and all of a sudden, you lose a fight because of that. You're going. All right. Um, so that's why I felt like I, I, I won, but even though I didn't, so that's why I'm looking at this going, <clears throat> it's gotta be the weight, right? It's gotta be the weight. That's why I, that's why I want to do my last one at 85. Um, <clears throat> and I tried to move up to 85 before my last fight, but my coaches and everybody said, Hey, let's just try one more at 70. But, like I said, here's the thing that if I go out there and I don't feel as strong and I, you know, I can't compete. Well, like I said, that's, that's really what it's about is that I felt like I still competed in that match, even though it wasn't my best performance, I still competed. Um, and you know, he doesn't hit me. Uh, he doesn't do anything. He had this 80 inch reach and he can't touch me. Um, you know, those are things that I put into consideration. Yes, I, I said if I lost, I would. But, again, it, I you know, what I'm saying is if I go out there and get beat up like I did the last two fights, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You know, where I still can't compete with those guys, which I clearly showed that I can. Now, I'll be better, I think, at 85, but... <clears throat> you know, like I said, if I go out there and I can't compete, well, I guess I, I can't make 70, right? I'm mm-hmm. not going to try to ever again. It's just too hard on my body. And if I make, and if I fight good at 85, well, then I'm going to stay there. But if I don't do good, then guess what? It's time, you know, I had my fun. I've had my time. It's, it's not worth, you know, like I said, it's not worth going out there and training for 12 weeks and then being done uh or i mean uh going out there and just losing uh and that's really what it's about is that uh, you know all i can say is that and everybody you know and here's one thing that really leads me to believe that i you know that fight was mine did you hear the booze after that yeah yeah you know the whole crowd thought i won that fight so i don't want to leave whenever the 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 fans think i've won and 
that's really where my head's at is that, Hey, they believe I won that fight. So I'm going to do one more. And if it doesn't, like I said, you know, and here's the thing is that <clears throat> I don't care about retirement. Uh, and you're right. I did use that as a, uh, something for people to get off my bat, mm. uh, about what's next, what's next. And for me, it was just sort of something that I could do easily. And, uh, plus it kept, <clears throat> you know, I don't know if you saw a little media rant, I plan on doing something else like that if they keep asking the same questions over and over. But it's it's just something that you know I want I want people to realize what's going on right now. Mm. Um, I mean, it's it's been difficult times for you as of late. Uh, some losses, obviously issues with weight cutting, putting your body through what I would guess is unimaginable issues. I mean, we were there at UFC 200. We saw you shaking up on those scales. Also the financial stress of losing a percentage of your purse. When you look back at everything that you went through to try and cut that weight and try and fight it well to weight, do you wish that you sort of moved to a middleweight a, a long time ago? And can you pinpoint a time that you sort of wish you would have moved to middleweight rather than sort of go through all those hardships? Uh, you know what, <clears throat> realistically, uh, after the, probably there was a part of me that wanted to move up at right after my, uh, I lost to Lawler. Oh, um, wow. Once I lost that, but I, I was sitting there going, you know what? I wonder if I can move up. Um, <clears throat> and really that's where my head's been since then is, Hey, let's just move up. It's going to be, you know I mean? It's going to be harder. But um, life will be more enjoyable. Uh, but the thing is that with that being said, you know, after the Lawler fight, I knew that if I, you know what I mean, I knew that if I did one thing, I could be back in the hunt. Mm. Well, guess what? I'm chasing a rabbit. I'm chasing a rabbit that <clears throat> I can't catch because, it's either the weight hurts me or I do make weight and I don't fight to my ability. And, you know, there's so much that's going on. Uh, and I, like I said, I'm just done t chasing the rabbit. I, I want to, I sort of want to fight for me and me alone. <clears throat> if that, uh, you know, and you're sitting there and you, but there's a lot that goes into moving up as well. Just because now, you know, so for example, I still want to stay 205, like I have been 210. So I don't want to balloon up to 240 and have to cut down to 85 or 230 and do the same thing. And hey, you still have to lose 80 or 50 pounds. Mm -hmm. I want to stay at 205, build up my strength, build up and start focusing on what I need to get better. Um, <clears throat> not about the weight. You know, most of my weight or most of my camps half of it's focusing on how to get myself down to uh, 170. Well, like I said, Friday, I wasn't even trying. I hit 196. All right, well, now I'm 10 over. Now I can actually go to my coach and say, hey, what do we need to work on? They're like, well, how's your weight? My weight? Oh, right now I am exactly, uh, you know, I'm 15 over. I wake up at like 13 over. And by the time I see them, I'm 15 to 16 over. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's sort of nice to have in your back pocket when it comes to training. Yeah, and I, I mean, I guess you sort of answered the question about whether, you know, w w whether you'll be putting on any extra muscle, you sort of still be staying around that size. I'm wondering, what, what was the UFC's reaction with your move to middleweight? Because it kind of felt like maybe they would have wanted you to do this a little bit earlier, but I guess you were a contender at welterweight. What was the discussions like with, with them regarding this move? Nothing. Right after the weight, right after the scale, I just looked at Joe Silva, and he's you know, he's gone now. He's retired. But mm. I looked at him and said, I'm done. I'm done at welterweight. The next time I fight, I'll be 85. He looked at me and goes, okay. You know, I like where your head's at. Because obviously, I, you know, like I said, it'd be one thing if I was, if I was making it or getting within a, a half a pound and my body wasn't shutting down like it has been. Uh that'd be a different story. 
<clears throat> but, you know, even though I have a great nutritionist, my body still doesn't want to cut the weight. You know, Lewis did an amazing job. He did everything he needed to do with me, right? Mm-hmm. But there's also a point where, like I said, <clears throat> having a family and having kids, it hurts me. And uh, and I'll never choose my kids or, or my career over my kids. So if that means that I got to move up a weight so that way I can still compete and still do good and have a chance, you know, and like I said, who knows? I mean, the perfect example is look at Cowboy, mm. Donald Cerrone. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was struggling at 55. He moves up to welterweight. Now he's not cutting as much weight. He's not killing himself. He's able to fight better. <clears throat> so you're going, there is a, there's a possibility that that's all I needed to do is move up. Move up to, 50, uh, to 185, and I could be a better fighter for that. But mm. like I said, if they still had IVs, then it wouldn't be a question. I could, I, you know, my last couple of fights, I wouldn't have been hurting like I was. And, I, you know, you can read fluid yourself a thousand times better mm-hmm. but but you have to adapt with the times the times are now that you can't use IV then guess what adapt with them move up and wait get something more now now something more around my natural body weight like I said you know one hard day of working at them hitting 96 mm-hmm. so now I just gotta lose 10 pounds 10 pounds is you know whenever you think about it, 10 pounds is really one day of hard work for me. I could easily do that. So now instead of saying, hey, I got another 30 pounds to lose or 25 pounds to lose, you say, hey, you got 10. Uh, And that's where, you know, I wish I understand why the UFC can't do it, but I would love for them to put a one, uh, you know, for example, uh, one 65 and then a 175 because a 175 I could still make mm. but I know they can't because whenever you think about it they have a pool of let's say 400 fighters right and out of that pool let's say 80 of them are in welterweight and let's say out of the top 10 I know I'd go to 175 some of the other guys could make 65 so now you're going, all right, now you're going to split up the pool from having a top 10 that's solid now down to a top five, maybe a top four that are solid. Yeah, it would be uh, an interesting move. And I mean, a lot of people are talking about the big differences in weight in those weight classes. I mean, we could talk about that issue for days and who knows, maybe one day they will come to it. And it's interesting that you mentioned fighters who move up in weight. Another example off the top of my mind is Robert Whitaker, who moved up from <laughs> to middleweight Mm. and has had extreme success in the division as well. Let's talk about your first opponent at middleweight, Hector Lombard. I mean, this is a great fight because not only does he have a big, big name, he's also sort of a smaller middleweight. So your transition won't be as drastic. He's also someone who's moved up from welterweight. What's your reaction to drawing him as your first opponent in the middleweight division? And that's really what I like is that he's somebody that I, you know, he's going to be strong. He's going to be strong for uh, middleweight, right? He's going to be a, a guy that has been at welterweight. And I can, you know, you can test the waters with. You can mm-hmm. move and you can, uh, <clears throat> you can see how it's going to be. Mm. Talk to us about how you see the matchup going down. Obviously, with your wrestling and your striking, and you got Lombard, who is also a good grappler, and he's got knockout power. Um, you know, he's had some issues with cardio in the past. How do you see this fight playing out? What kind of advantages do you believe you'll ha- you'll hold over him, Johnny? Uh, you know what? I think it's going to do good. Um, I think it's going to do very good um, because you know you got to think that I have knockout power too. Mm. I just haven't been able to show because I didn't have what you know. I, I really think that it's because I've been. I've been using all my energy to make what uh, middle or I mean uh, middle way uh, welterweight. Now, what if I can use all that time and effort in refocusing on? Oh, sorry, I kicked my truck. Um, That's all right. To 
focus on jumping from, you know, using all my energy to go down to uh, 170, if I can use that energy to get my power back, to get my combinations better, to get uh, my energy levels back and be able to fight the way that I want to, you know, I could knock people out again. And that's really what, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, hey, if I can get stronger, I'm still going to be fast because I, I'm so used to 170, right? Mm-hmm. Where these, these middleweights, they're not used to fighting welterweights that have fast hands, that have, you know, don't get me wrong, middleweights, they're going to have heavy hands as well. But <laughs> if I can be faster than them because I'm not ballooning up myself, to fit middleweight, I'm trying to just make myself where I fit middleweight in a way that doesn't strain me. Um, and that's really, like I said, if I can go out there, build a little bit of strength, still stay fast, still have cardio, and and have the wrestling background that I do, I think I can compete with a lot of the guys at middleweight. I really do. I mean, you, you've spoken time and time again about how you don't want to look forward past your opponent, but I'm curious, is the middleweight title in the back of your, of your mind as a goal? Are you, are you not at that point yet where you can really sort of set that in your mind as something that you want? Well, it's something that I want, of course, right? Because anything I do, I want to set myself to the highest standard. So if I tell myself, oh, it's not in the mindset – <clears throat> then why am I moving up the middle weight? I should just retire now. I should just say, hey, I'm done with it uh, and move on. Um, but it is in my mindset, even though I haven't fought up there yet, but it's something that I'd like to try to achieve. Who knows if I can, right? Mm-hmm. But who's to say I can't? Yeah, I'm not the tallest guy. Yeah, I'm not the, you know, I don't look like an 85 pounder but i don't look like a 70 pounder either um and that's really what it boils down to is in my mind i'm telling myself i can and i will and i think that's the most important thing is sit there and say hey i can do this i will do this and that's really where my mindset is all right, Johnny, we really appreciate your time and, and we'll let you go in just a moment. But one more thing that we wanted to quickly cover before we let you go, uh, and that is obviously you mentioned you've got one fight left on your contract. Uh, as you know, last year a huge story was fighters going to the free agency and uh, you know testing their worth. Kind of seems like slowly it's becoming a lot more acceptable these days. I'm, I'm sure you, you sort of focus just on the fight at hand, but where do you stand on that? If this is your last fight on your UFC contract, do you think you would potentially, you know, look to explore the, the, the free agency? What, what, what is your standing with, with the UFC? You know, my standing with the UFC is good, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hope it is. Mm. Um, and, you know, really, I, I haven't thought much on that, okay? Mm-hmm. I haven't. Uh, I know that... You know, I got it. You know, they're probably thinking, well, is Johnny washed up? Can he do more? Can he not? Um, so in my head, I'm thinking I, I still have to prove my worth. So I got to go out there and perform to the way I, I know I can. And if I do that, I'll get my hand raised and they'll probably come back with another contract. Um, but then again, they might, even though I win, they might say, Johnny, we just don't see a, a middleweight. And sorry uh if that happens then then we'll reassess what i need to do um but as of right now uh literally your contract is on the line right Mm-mm. yeah uh so do you do you, do you, so so, do you sort of feel, feel pressure like in, in terms of your performance to go out there and kind of have a really good performance send a message just so that that next contract assuming you get one is something that you'll be happy with yeah, that's exactly right. And that's the way I'm looking at it. Every fight is your most important one, and this could be my last one. Hmm. <clears throat> Meaning that they say, we don't want you back. Even if I win, like I said, even if I go out there and win, they might say, Johnny, we don't want you back. 
or they might say, hey, we do want you back. So that's how important this fight is to me, that I got to go out there and prove my work. Uh, does it put more more uh, pressure on me? No. I think what it really boils down to is <clears throat> can I can I still perform like I want to? Mm. You know, and is welterweight the weight that's going to let me do that? Let me show that I show the fans and show the people that I can still <clears throat> do what I want to do and achieve what I need to achieve. Um, and I do believe that. You know, even even right now, my shape is good. <clears throat> I'm running. I'm doing things that I need to be doing like I would if I was making 170. And I'll tell you a little secret. Guess what? I'm not going to make 185. <clears throat> my Like, I've always felt the best at 182. Whenever I hit 182, <clears throat> I wow. still feel awesome. And guess what? Guess what I feel like whenever I fight my best, 195. So instead of gaining 20 pounds, that 20 pounds sitting on you, I don't want to see over 195 the day of the fight. Um, and that's really, uh, like I told my coaches, I said, you know, like I've said this before already, I didn't go up and wait to gain weight or to just say, hey, it doesn't matter. I can fight at 185 and jump up to 210 to the fight. No. When do I feel the quickest? When do I feel the strongest? It's right around 182. I still have to eat good. I still have to run. I still have to work hard. Um, and on fight day, if I can fight right around 192, 195, that's when I'm going to be the quickest, the strongest, and have the best shape. We, and now, the way that I'm looking at it, instead of gaining 25 pounds back to fight, if I can do 10 pounds, now I'm not going to be as heavy as water loaded and all these things that have hurt me in the past. I'm going to be cutting all that out. Yeah, well, it's good. It's exciting times for Johnny exciting Hendricks. Times. And I mean, so much stuff going on. Uh, Johnny, before we let you go, and we really appreciate the time. Just a quick prediction. How do you see yourself beating uh, Hector Lombard on February 19th? How do, what, what stands out in your mind as the way that you're walking out as the winner? Uh, you know what? Right now, uh, I really think that once once a couple of things happen, I think that my my hands are going to do the work uh, because he's going to be a guy that's not going to back away from me. You know, uh, he's going to be a guy that's going to move forward that doesn't care about my power. He's going to try to hit me, and I and I know I'm going to be able to touch him. So I have a feeling that my hands are going to be what ends the fight. Well, there you go, guys. The fight is going to be on February 19th, UFC Fight Night 105. Johnny Hendricks takes on Hector Lombard. Johnny, I'm not going to lie. We're absolutely thrilled here that not only are you sticking around, but also the fact that you're not going to be killing yourself to make 170. So we're thrilled to, to be seeing you and watching you fight. Don't forget to follow the man on Twitter, at Johnny Hendricks. And uh, Johnny, as always, thank you so much for your time. Sorry I went over, but uh, it, was, it was a pleasure chatting to you. Hey, no worries. Thank you, guys, and y'all have a wonderful day. This is Chael Sonnen, and you are listening to Submission Radio. All right, guys, and next guest is one of the top lightweights in the UFC. Through his past appearances on the show, we have discovered his love for the Iron Sheik and that his favorite food is ice cream. He will now be making the big trip over to Australia for fun times and seminars. Long Island's own Raging Al Iaquinta. Welcome back to Submission Radio, man. It's been a long time. How's it going today? It's been a while. It's going good. It's going real good. Um, I appreciate you guys having me on. Well, man, the pleasure is all ours. You know, we're big Al fans, and we were super excited because you're actually coming down to our shores next week. You messaged us and said that you'd booked a somewhat spontaneous trip down to Australia. I mean, so many great things down in Australia, but talk, talk to us about the decision to make this trip. I mean, when did you make it, and what sort of prompted you to do the spontaneous trip down here? Uh, a lot of it was the weather here in New York. The weather <laughs> here in New York is mis miserable, <laughs> and uh, I was not. I was definitely not born to be in this kind of weather <laughs> and then i remembered two years ago when i came to australia in the winter it was the summer so i want to get back there and i reached out you know when i was there the last time uh made some good connections met a, met a lot of people i just reached out to a few people and i i asked them if uh if they'd be interested in, in having me do a seminar i had a lot of uh interest in alex cariotti um 
he really he was he was really into it and I, I think he's uh he's got a, a a large amount of students that are going to come to the first seminar and uh got two more after that and then there's there's a couple more that we're still working on so it's definitely uh it's definitely going to be fun it's a little stressful trying to put this together all last minute <laughs> but uh once i get there it'll be worth it for sure yeah yeah we'll mention the seminars in a second but obviously two years ago you had a lot of success here you came down you fought at ufc fight no 55 you beat ross pearson so i'm I'm sure you got a lot of good memories uh you mentioned last year actually that you haven't gone on a vacation in years is this finally the first one you're taking uh i mean is it a is it's i'm going there to teach seminars and so i guess yeah it's kind of you know it's not a hundred percent vacation vacation but it is uh kind of like a little working vacation you know i'm gonna be (laughs) Also teaching private lessons at, at the gyms that I teach seminars at, so I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be still in the gym, but uh, it's gonna be in the su- I'll be in the summer, you know, mm. I'll be in the gym in the summer, and after the, after uh, training, I can go to the beach and hang out and kind of just relax in the sun. So, well, talk to us about these seminars that you'll be doing down here. You're obviously from the world renowned Sarah Longo Gym in Long Island. In New York, home of guys like Chris Weidman, Aljamain Sterling, Matt Sarah, and more. What can people expect? From an Ally Quinta seminar, and what will you be focusing on? Uh, most of them, they're all going to be stand up. I'll be starting with the kickboxing, boxing, and then moving on to setups into takedowns, uh, and then stuff on the ground. You know, I've been around for a while. I've, I've learned from so many of the top coaches in the world, so I've I've got a, a wealth of knowledge that um, I can pass down to to people and. So far, they've they've enjoyed it. I've been doing a lot of seminars here on the East Coast, and really around the country in in the U.S. And I've had some good feedback, and I enjoy doing it. I enjoy going in and and uh, having a, a group of uh, of athletes that are interested in learning. And mm. uh, you know, it's a couple a couple hours where you know it's just all focused on getting as much out of it as as they can. And I just try to uh, you know when they leave there, hopefully you know. I, my goal is at least you're gonna have one thing that you never saw before, but for most people, I think they they learn you know a whole a whole bunch of stuff. And um, after the seminars, everyone comes up to me and and you know they tell me what they liked, and that's uh, that's a great feeling, you know. It's awesome, yeah. I mean, and, and it's good that you sort of have that back and forth with people, and they give you that instant feedback, and you can you can kind of take it and sort of work that into the next seminar. Obviously, the sport is so mental. Do you do sort of a Q and A at these seminars and sort of take you know, field questions, or is it more sort of on the fly while you're teaching and showing techniques? You sort of have that discussion with people. How how exactly does it work? Yeah, it's it's you know I have maybe that's something I'll add in. It's kind of like a question and answer thing at the end. Mm. Um, usually, usually. Uh, there's a, there's people that'll, they'll, they'll come up with their questions throughout the, throughout the day. But yeah, I guess there are some people that might be, uh, you know, hesitant to ask questions. So I think that's good. I'll, I'll definitely incorporate that little question and answer thing at the end and they can kind of pick my brain and see what, uh, you know, whatever questions they have. But yeah, we go over a lot of, a lot of mentality stuff. Usually someone will ask a question about one of my fights and I'll just, branch off from there and get you know get into a little bit more of the mental aspect of the sport but um definitely going forward that's something that i'll uh, incorporate for sure talk to us a little bit about how you're going to be spending some of your downtime here in australia i mean you're going to be super busy doing the seminars and a lot of the privates but you'll find yourself with a bit of spare time do you have anything on the old bucket list that you want to try sure. and tick off while you're down here uh i don't know about any bucket list stuff i think i just want to Hang out down by the beach, you know, go down to Bondi, Manly, mm. and any beach in between and just kind of <laughs> kick it, relax, you know, go up to the bars at the, at the end of the day and just kind of kind of hang out and, you know, meet some different people and see, see what's going on out there, you know. Mm-hmm. The Aussies are going to love your, your your big New York personality. We were in New York in November, and uh, a, a lot of great people there. I think the Aussies and the New Yorkers mesh well. And uh, the good thing is that everybody will be able to follow you along on all your adventures because you'll be taking some time and uh, and doing blogging on uh, on our website, smishradio.com. Just curious, what what made you want to blog and sort of put your put your thoughts out there on uh, I guess not paper these days, but to sort of you know in, in words and writing. Uh, you know, it's it was. As I was telling people about this, uh, a couple of people suggested, and, and they said, you know, people people are doing this all over. They go and travel to 
kind of destination places and uh, you know, w- doing workouts and stuff like this. I'm sure this is something that somebody's going to want to do one day is visit Australia and kind of do a, um, you know, a, a martial arts based vacation kind of thing. So if I can kind of map it out for them and let them know the good places to go train and the, the healthy spots to go eat afterwards and just kind of like the lifestyle a, a, a professional fighter would live when traveling in Australia. I think that'd be uh, you know interesting read and definitely something that could help people out in the future. That's right. Some recommendations perhaps of a couple of good bars to stop by after a big victory. There'll be a lot of fun oh, yeah. things, I, I guess, in that blog. Now, let's talk about your real estate work. I mean, everybody knows you're very successful at the moment um, working in real estate in New York. How does everybody feel about you taking a break from work and going on this holiday? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not really too big of a deal with the, with the real estate. It's kind of just, uh, you know, you're kind of your own boss. You can kind of pick when uh, when you when you want to work and when you don't. You don't work, you don't get paid, so... You know, it's more, it's, uh, it's that kind of, that kind of job. So, um, I'll be getting back right now. It's starting, you know, the, the dead season is kind of ending and starting to pick up. So once I get back, I'll be back the end of February and it'll be, it'll be the good time. And I'll get right, right back into the swing of things with that for sure. So I have, uh, you know, I have a couple good, good things in the pipeline. I got a, a couple of houses lit that I just, uh, I'm listing. So when I get back, it's, it's on. You know, this is kind of like the calm before the storm. I'm going to go there, hang out, and then when I come back, it's on. I'm I'm wondering, how have you found this? Because, I mean, we'll, we'll sort of touch on your MMA career in a moment, but going and making this transition from, you know, fighting and, and you doing that for so many years to now doing real estate, how, how have you found that whole process? And, and, you know, you've been doing this for a while now. How does it all feel to you? Uh, it's tough. I don't know. I definitely would rather be fighting. Um, it's pretty hard when you're, you know, fighting in front of thousands of people or whatever, and then now you're working in an office. But um, I got to be honest, as far as like my health goes, I'm this is probably the healthiest I've been in a while. As far you know, in, in no injuries, and I'm not just I'm not going home every day with my neck nagging pain stuff like that. So. That's definitely a good part. I miss I miss a lot of it, but a lot of it I don't miss. Um, and you know, I I feel like I'm kind of you know, I'm saving myself. You know, I don't know. It's it's not been easy, but uh, I know I'm doing doing the right thing for right now. Mm. And um, that's not say, not to say that you know, I, I'm going out to Denver this weekend to see Aljo and. I'm sure I'll see a lot of the the people from the UFC, and maybe we'll have a conversation. Maybe we won't, but uh, you know, I'm definitely uh, definitely definitely miss fighting. That's for sure. I definitely miss fighting. Mm-mm, because everybody knows about your appearance on the MMA Hour last year. It was a very eye-opening one. We spoke about the way the UFC has treated you and the difficulties you've gone through. I'm just wondering, Al, I mean, what was the aftermath like afterwards? You mentioned how you may be speaking to people from the UFC when you go up uh, to see Aljo, but uh, did anybody from the UFC speak to you after that appearance on the MMA hour? Have there been any updates or progress or any back and forth from the UFC since you sort of did that interview and put that stuff out on the table? Uh, no, not really. It's just been kind of, I've been doing my own thing and, and leaving it at that. Um, you know, they kind of just said, reach out to us when you're ready to fight again and uh you know that's that so it is you know that is what it is i'm just kind of taking it day by day and and seeing what you know seeing how it goes I'm I'm wondering how that works now cuz you mentioned it's it's hard sort of doing real estate it's something that's obviously good for your health and things like that but fighting is kind of I'm sensing that that's what you really want to do and the UFC kind of aren't re- really budging how I, I guess I guess how do you work towards the goal of, of winning a fight again? Because you're kind of fighting this battle and standing up for what you believe in. How do you sort of get back to sort of find that middle ground and, and kind of do what you, you love the most? Yeah, I mean, I don't even know if it's that I was that I'm fighting for what I believe in. It's not like I'm, I don't know, I'm just really, I'm just kind of, uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm thinking for like right now, I just, I was hurting, my body was hurting a lot. I was not getting paid a lot. I got hurt. I was 
I felt like I was kind of hung out to dry for a little bit. So I took a little break and see, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe the real estate thing is what I want to do. Maybe it's not, maybe, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's tough. Well, uh, I'm definitely not going to, uh, it's, it's not like I took a stand for every, and a lot of people made it that, and I guess maybe, I guess I was kind of doing it, but, um, I just really didn't feel like fighting in New York, uh, in November, uh, for w- what the conditions were for the guy that I was fighting for the amount of money I was fighting for, um, the amount of money that that event was bringing in, uh, just didn't, it didn't sit right. It didn't feel right to me. It didn't, you know, it didn't make sense for me to fight for, you know, what I was going to fight for. So I, I asked him to, you know, if we could talk about renegotiating something and I basically got cursed out. So, mm. and so yeah, basically I just went on and did my own thing and, and that's it. It's not, you know, it's not, they're running a business. I'm running a business where that's all it is. It's, you know, I look, I got to look out for my health though. That's the first thing when, uh, you know, when I'm going into a training camp and, you know, I'm flying people in and I, I can't sleep good at night because my neck's hurting and, uh, you know, my, I, I had a knee surgery, two knee surgery, and then you know, I take a year off and I can't get any, you know, it's asking them to get, you know, can I do appearances? Is there anything I could do? Is there, and I realize I can only get paid when I fight. I realize I only get sponsorships when I fight, but is there, you know, is there anything I, you know, I could do while I'm out? And they really just, we're just like, hey, you know, when you're ready to fight, let us know, kind of thing. So, I don't know. It's, uh, it, we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully, I get back in there soon. You know, mm. I'm still mm. in shape. I'm still, I'm still hungry. I'm still ready to go. So, if uh, if the right fight makes, if there's a fight that makes sense, if something, so we'll see. I don't know. I'm not really. I haven't really talked to anybody. So, I'll talk to my manager when I get out to Denver, and we'll kind of sit down and see where we're at. Mm-mm. I mean, you got called out by Kevin Lee and responded that you retired. Obviously, you just mentioned that you're not retired now. But uh, was was that response just due to the fact that you had no interest in the matchup, or at that point, were you actually yeah, that thinking guy, that you were retired? Or uh, yeah, I don't know. I wasn't. I I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. I was just <laughs> thinking, like, shut the shut the fuck up! Holy shit, <laughs> that guy! Like, dude, I don't know. Beat somebody, beat like do something. You guy, you freaking, I don't know. That guy's just—he's not on my level, so that's you know—he's got to win a few fights for sure. Um, but there's a couple of fights out there that I do that I do do think would be good, you know. I tell think, tell uh, us, man, who 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 is on on I, the Ally Quinta radar? Who, who would you be well, sort I of think, happy to fight? I think Tiago Tiago Alves didn't make. He couldn't make 155, so I'd be very I'd be willing to go up to 170 if he wants to go to one. If he just wants to not mm. wants to just chill out and. I'll go. Up, I'll go up to 170 and fight him. You know. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I think that that'd be good. That'd be fun. I wouldn't have to cut weight. He. I mean. He. He fought. Uh, you know, Jim Miller. I guess. You know, he cut a lot of weight, so he didn't look. He didn't look great. But if he wants to fight at 170, that'd be cool. Um. Yeah. I don't know. There's a bunch. There's there's a, there's a lot of fights out there. So we'll see. Do you think, and again, maybe maybe your mindset's not really there at the moment, but if, if you were to fight someone like a Tiago Alves, a guy who missed weight in his last fight, and you would be going up a weight class, do you think that would be something where, you know, it, it would sort of give you leverage and sort of a, a good reason to say to UFC, hey, I'm going up in weight, you know, may, maybe I deserve a little bit more. Do, do you think that would sort of work? Uh, probably not. <laughs> but I tell you what, I tell you what, if I go up to 170 and I fight like a 55 or at 170, makes a lot more sense to me you know i feel like if i'm gonna cut 15 pounds and i'm gonna starve myself and diet for that long i should be compensated for it you know so definitely would take that into consideration you know what i mean mm-hmm. it's a lot it's a lot less work to uh to have to fight at 170 so you know if i fight maybe come, come back i've been out for like two years so fight somebody at 170 who knows? Maybe I'll stay at 170. I fought George Masvidal at 170. I mean, at 55, he's went up to he went up to 170, and he's doing good. So I, I don't see why I wouldn't be able to do good. I'd be faster than everybody. Uh, the strength would be would be something I had to deal with, but I 
I've sparred with 70 pounders in the gym all the time, and I do great. So I don't know. I think that might be a definite option for me. I mean, the the big issue with a lot of fighters fighting in the UFC is the fact that you're not really getting the sponsorship anymore, and Reebok now pays your set rate. How definite is your future with the UFC? How many fights do you still have left in your contract? Is it a fact where you could just have a couple more fights and then you'd be out, or are you stuck in there for quite a substantial amount of fights? Uh, I've got three three fights, three fights left on my deal. I think. Right, so, and do you, yeah, do you ever so. think about the fact of just, hey, I'll just fight these out and then I could just try free agency and sort of get that sponsorship money somewhere else or to you three fights? I mean, that's that's still a lot to put in to get out of a company. Yeah, I don't know I don't know if there is any sponsorship anywhere else. I think the I think the 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 Reebok thing just I mean, the UFC you know they kind of run things. They run the whole. Sh- they whole run everything. And when the when the sponsors dropped out of the UFC, I think they kind of they kind of fell off of everywhere. You know, I don't mm. think I don't think there's even guys in Bellator. I, I don't know if they're getting paid that much because with the sponsorships. Because I think it, uh, a lot of it just dried up. You know, mm. if guys aren't going to be sponsored in the UFC. If they're not going to throw money into the UFC, uh, I don't know if they're going to throw it in anywhere. You know. Yeah, yeah. Al, we, we appreciate your time, and uh, we'll, we'll let you go really soon. A few more questions. One of them i got to ask, obviously, since your interview last year on the MMA Hour, a lot of things have taken place. A lot of things have sort of begin to take shape. One of them is obviously MMA uh, unions and uh, associations. The latest one, the MMA AA with, you know, guys like Tim Kennedy and George St. Pierre. Has anyone like that reached out to you since your situation, and, and where do you stand on that? Is it something you would potentially be interested in? No, definitely. They've reached out to me, and I uh, definitely I have a lot of interest. I think that it's necessary immediately that the UFC that that the UFC. I think the UFC should be the ones, uh, you know, starting this union. If if you know they want the, the drug testing, right? Because they want everything to be fair mm. and level playing field, just like their other sports. They should want to fight a play a union. You know, so that everything's fair, just like the other sports. You know, you hear you hear um, you hear them talk about you know the drug testing. We have the most the strict strictest drug testing policy, so that it's fair for the fighters. You know, and that's such a big deal that it's fair for the fighters. So shouldn't it be fair for the fighters to to have their own say and have have their voice being heard, just like the other sports? So I think I think the UFC's Every time someone asks them a question, they, their response is, you know, there can't be a union because these guys are independent contractors. And so I, I think they, I, I think that they should be, um, you know, they should be the ones trying to, trying to, if not push for it, just make sure it happens in the right way, you know, because eventually it's going to happen. And, and, uh, I don't know. I think, I think if they had part in it, it would be, it, it would be a lot better. But I guess, you know, that's definitely against their, you know, their business practices or mm. whatever they got going on. But um, but as far as it goes, you know, I don't know. I don't know. There's a, there's, there's a couple of different organizations. Um, and and we'll see. You know, I think I think the newest one is the, the MMA uh, Fighters Association with uh, – with GSP and, and TJ Dillashaw, Tim Kennedy, and those guys, so I think that having a guy like GSP is huge. Um, I think they have a lot of big big name guys, and I think that's you know that's that's the best shot as of right now. So I'm uh, yeah, I'm definitely staying in contact with them, and we'll see what they what what comes about of that for sure. Interesting. So you haven't really put your name towards any of them, but you'll you'll sort of be discussing stuff with them. I'm with them. I'm with, I'm down with them all for sure. I'm I'm down with all of them. Yeah, I've, I've talked to them all, and I I think they all have a good plan. Uh, you know, I told I definitely. I don't think it's the kind of thing where I have to choose just one. I think uh, we'll see which one, which one has the most backing, which one has the best plan. I don't. I don't like the con. I don't like the you know kind of attacking the UFC stance. I think every need. I think it needs to be done more where uh, you know you're working together. I think. I think Bjorn Rebney. Uh, I think he had a you know his. I don't know if uh, it's, it was a little 
confrontational, I guess, is mm-hmm. the word. But I, I don't. I think it kind of sat the wrong way with a lot of the people. So I think that you know, I think that was a big, big thing that you know, having him there and the, and the announcement of it. But uh, I know him and Dana probably don't get along at all. So, uh, but the, the the fighters and to be honest with you, I spoke with him and he does. He does seem to really care about the fighters and want you know this organization to do well. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see what unfolds. Al, everybody's excited to see you come down to Australia. It's all happening next week. Everybody's just pumped for this. And I'm sure when they listen to this, they'll want to find out where they can check you out. We've got a few dates here. Yeah, so on Wednesday, the 1st of February, we've got Alex Cariotti in uh, in Hornsby, and that's going to be in the evening. These are all, of course, in Sydney. Uh, Friday, the 3rd of February, for anybody in Sydney or near Moorbank, the Sinizic Parosh Martial Arts, uh, that's obviously where Alvis Sinizic is from. That's going to be one in the evening. And Saturday, the 11th of February, at the UFC gym in Alexandria, and uh, that is going to be in the afternoon. So there's a lot of options to choose from, and if you do want to do uh, any seminars with uh, with Ally Quinta, which we obviously strongly suggest, Jess, there's a lot of options, so it's going to be a lot of fun. So, Al, before we let you go, um, do you have any other messages for the Australian fans? I know they're excited to see you down here. Do you have any any messages for them as you sort of make your way down to Australia next week? Uh, come down to the come down to the seminars, check them out, and uh, you know, hang out, maybe grab a beer after. So this, hit the beach, summertime. I'm looking forward to it. Well, there you guys go. He's going to be the man of the summer over there in Sydney. Make sure to check him out. Grab a beer with him, check out his seminars, and who knows, maybe Al will be climbing the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Maybe he'll be doing some surfing down in Manly. You never know where this man's going to be. Just make sure yeah. to follow him on Twitter and find out exactly when he's down there. You'll also have the opportunity to do private classes with him. If they do want to do a private class with you, Al, what's the best way for them to book it? Is it through the gym? Do you want them to hit you up directly via social media? What's the best process? Yeah, if you want to hit me up on Twitter, uh, at Ally Quinta. Or, uh, you know, contact any of those gyms that uh, that you mentioned. And, of course, the biggest thing of all, the big blog. Uh, Al's going to be writing a blog about his time down here. That's going to be available on SubmissionRadio.com. And, guys, we'll be sharing it on all our social media outlets as well as all the other ways we can get it out there. Make sure to check it out. I'm expecting to see some fun adventures in the world of Al when he comes down to Australia. Al? Uh, it's going to be it's gonna be fun for sure. It's going to... It's going to be a good time. Al, we wish you a very safe trip down under. Enjoy going back in time to Australia where it's nice and warm and the beer is cold. We can't wait to see you down here. And, guys, make sure to book this seminar. You don't want to miss it. Al will be here for a short time only, and spots will be taken quickly. So jump on, book now, and if you have any questions, follow him on Twitter and contact the gyms we mentioned for more information. Al, we can't wait to see you down here. Awesome, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, this is Ariel Hawani, and you're listening to Submission Radio with my two favorite mates, Dennis and Casper. All right, guys, our next guest is the man of the hour. If you go on his Twitter, his bio says he can become anything. Just believe in yourself and man. What a career he's had. He is just coming off Bellator 170, where he retired on a historic, legendary career. He is one of the biggest names in the sport. Tito Ortiz, welcome to Submission Radio. It's a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you very, very much, man. It's uh, probably nice to get all the stress out of my body, man. After 14 week camp, it was uh, it was a tough one, and it went kind of how I expected it to go. It was just like, right, like, literally, training. Training was my fight. It was funny because when I right before I walked out, I just thought in my head, "I'm like, it's just another day of training, just another day of training," and I walked in. And, Kel did everything I thought he was going to do. You know, um, everything I defended, it was uh, it was great, man. It was a great, 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 great night. Hard can, work does pay off. We can only imagine. It, well, talk to us about the night. I mean, all we saw what was whatever was on TV and then the press conference. What was that night like? What, what did you do to go out and sort of celebrate? Um, you know, um, I just kind of had to kind of just take a step back and just kind of put it all in my mind. I still don't have really realized exactly what happened. You know, I think uh, more than anything, it was just... I want to go in. I want to perform the best I possibly could and leave it all out there. Um, and to think that 14 weeks only lasted two minutes and five seconds, it just makes you frustrated because I want it to be a little longer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wanted to be able to elbow Chell in the face a little more. 
But once he gave my back, it was just, uh, I gave his back. I couldn't, could not take the choke. Um, and believe me, I was squeezing him so hard. People saw how purple his face was. I was trying to make him go unconscious, but McCarthy had to rip me off. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, obviously, the commission not going to pursue that, even though you held on the choke a little bit long. Um, we saw online that you mentioned that, you know, we're just in the heat of the moment. But how about this? This event is a big, big success. It's the third most watched Bellator broadcast in history. The main event itself averaged 1.85 million viewers, making it the fourth most watched fight in the company history. And Tito, on Saturday... You were the second most searched topic of the day on Google with more than 200,000 wow. searches behind only the women matches, which, you know, we know what people are looking for with those women matches. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, how does that feel? That's a crazy metric to go along with the fact that you just had a legendary finish to a crazy career. You know, I was uh, very, very happy the way it all ended and the way I was presented. And um, like I say, the hard work pays off and, with my son there, I think there's a little more extra pressure. Um, have my son there, and you know, I we walk down, I look at him, and I see tears rolling down his face, and he wasn't sure. And I looked down at the son. I promise you, I'm gonna get my hand raised because okay, Dad, go out there, go out there, kick butt. And it was just, uh, it, everything was like it was meant to be. Um, everything. Uh, I think in my whole life, everything has been meant to be. You know, if I would have beaten Liam and Gary last year, I probably you know, wouldn't be in the same shoes and enjoy the same way of uh, retiring the way I did on Saturday night. Um, but I was ready. I was, um, wasn't going to let anything stop the fight on my side. You know, um, Joe had me in a little bit of a choke and, uh, with the guillotine for a second, but it was maybe a second, but I just said, relax. And, you know, if I push on his elbow, I could feel my head sliding out and was, sure enough, boop, it slid out. And that half card pass is something that uh, we worked a lot with me and Scott Carr and Rafael Davis. Uh, BJ Penn actually went over just one day. We went over it, and he says this works no matter what to get the mount. And I've always been a person that liked the mount because guys usually push me off. Well, I secured the mount so much during camp with Scott Carr and uh, Rafael Davis that they're bigger than Chell. I was able to secure them, and they're not going anywhere. And just a dangerous spot of me getting in my elbows. You know, I think I touched Chell with two small elbows and. He said he felt them. Mm. And if I had an opportunity to hit him with more elbows, I think it would have been a little more bloodier. But he gave his back, and I was dry. There was always no sweat on me, and I was strong as hell. And I squeezed like a anaconda, man. I said, like, that uh, that lion is got to eat for the first time. And I think it was <laughs> by the neck and wasn't going to let go. And that's, that's what was in my mind. I was squeezing but dear life. And I'm super, super, super strong right now. I mean, when you deadlift 415 for 10s with no problem and – you know, all the ab work that I've done, all the um, bench pressing and benching 395 for fours. I mean, I, I've i got really, really strong for this fight because I knew that strength was going to come to a factor to defend the shot on Shell. But I was the only one to get the first punch. I was the one to get the first takedown. I ended up having to defend the guillotine. I ended up having to um, defend the um, neck crank. The neck crank he got me on is really what made me sore. I mean, I have a lot of problems with my neck right now because of it. Uh, I may have to get surgery. I'm not sure. Um, wow. I gotta get an MRI in the morning, but uh, I've been having some numbness going down my left arm. Mm. Um, that never happened before. But that first nut crank he caught me in, um, it, it wasn't a choke. I think it was more of just a strain, and he kind of pulled my head forward. And that was, you know, I think that was the thing that kind of made me move quicker. I mean, when he went to the guillotine, um, I was happy because that's what we should been defending the whole time. And during camp, I'd had a little problems trying to defend it. And in this one, I was able to kind of suck it up, be relax myself, and just have the jiu-jitsu um, martial arts side of it, just relaxing in the position and just wait for his grip to get a little more weaker. And pop, my head comes out, and I finish it. I'm wondering, Tito, obviously this is a huge moment. Have you had a chance to re-watch it and sort of relive that moment yet? Um, only once. Um, this, I think on Sunday when I got home, um, my three boys are here with me because my youngest um, Jesse and Journey or seven, I, I wait until um, I get home and I watch it with them so they understand that dad's okay no matter what. But I got to watch it once and it just seems so chill, man. It was like a movie. It was just like, uh, I don't know, man. I, I just look at it and just, I'm, I'm thankful. You know, hard work pays off. Mm. I, I watched the fight and it was everything that I went through during camp. Um, the passing position, getting the mount position, throwing an elbow, him turning his back. 
and there's Scott Card saying as soon as his palm hits the hits the floor, you gotta go for the choke. And I automatically did that and I'm another person known to go for rear naked chokes, but I had an opportunity to choke him out and finish it quick, so why not get it done quick and call it a day, especially after that little neck crank he got me on. I don't want a chance of some serious happening to me, so I probably should have let it go and cut the ground pound a little more, but like I say, no reason to give one great position for a uh, maybe position. Mm-hmm. I have to ask this, Tito, because as as you would know, a lot of people on social media and a lot of people uh, on the internet, they were saying things about how uh, you know th- there was sort of accusations that the fight was fixed and things like that. I, I just want to know like, what your thoughts are on that. Obviously, you're coming off this big win, but how did you sort of react to that? And I also wanted to ask you specifically, because a lot of people are saying, oh, there were moments where Tito was tapping on the ground and it, it looked like he was giving Chael Sonnen some kind of cues. And I wanted to give you an ex- a chance to sort of explain do you remember that in the fight do, do you remember what was going through your mind at that point yeah i know exactly going through my mind it was defend the choke and not get taken down mm-hmm. not to let him have my back mm-hmm. um for people to say the fight was fixed fucking it's just, just ridiculous are you kidding me right now i'm gonna get 14 weeks of my life i'm gonna miss out on a thanksgiving miss out on a christmas miss out on a new year's to have a fixed fight i've never been a part of that. i want to do a fixed fight i'd be doing wwe for people to say that, that's just very disrespectful. For any fighters to say that, that's disrespectful. Especially fighters that haven't helped out through their career. Um, I, it just is it, a disrespect. I, I've worked so damn hard. The shit that Chell said, I, I hate the guy. I held on to that choke. I was trying to break his neck. I was, and I had the choke over his chin. I was still squeezing the shit. And I don't want to break his chin. <laughs> I want to break his neck. This had nothing to do with fix at all. I was getting paid the same amount of money no matter what. At the end of the day, when I step in that cage, I'm there to fight for my name. It's not about money. It's not about who's going to win or lose. It's about me winning. That's all that matters. And why would they set up Chell to lose if he signed a fight-fight deal? Mm, it just right, doesn't yeah. make any sense. And for some of them to say that I tapped, people need to watch that right position where my hands were, were at. And I was fighting the hands. That's what I'm trying to do, fighting the hands. And I don't know. That, that's I, I, it's nonsense. I haven't really responded to anybody on the internet because I've seen it. You're the first person that I've responded to because we're able to talk about it mm-hmm. and know to get my words out of text and through uh, Twitter or through a tweet. So mm-hmm. that's just ridiculous. That's disrespecting my career, disrespecting my legacy, um, and the hard work I put in, the sacrifice I have away from my children and my family. Um, and Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's, I've sacrificed so much for this fight. People see me in the best shape that I was. I, I, that's the best shape I've been in since 2006. I was shredded. I cut down from 225 down to 204.8 uh, within mm-hmm. two and a half days. Um, there's nothing fixed about anything at all. I dislike Chell. I still dislike Chell because he had an opportunity to apologize. He didn't apologize. He talked personal stuff about me. Guy's an asshole. He's always going to be an asshole. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's good that you've addressed it to all the fans and now that they're listening. I guess it, they could make up their mind and understand what really happened. Let's talk about this momentum that you're on. I mean, you're, you're the man of the hour. Everybody is talking Tito Ortiz. The, the performance was amazing. Was it difficult for you to sort of retire on that moment? I mean, a lot of people were saying, hey, there, there's some fire in Tito coming back and fighting a few of these other guys that have just joined up to the company, guys like Vanderlei and these other guys. Was it difficult to walk away on such a high note? Um, not really, just because of how many surgeries I've had. Mm. You understand, I mean, right now that my left arm is going in and out from being numb and not numb, mm. that scares me. You know, I, I don't want to risk a chance of me going paralyzed for more fights. 20 years, I've done everything I wanted to do in MMA. Um, it's not hard because I, I push myself to the maximum. I've done as much as I possibly can do with my body. And my body can't do any more. Um... I'm, I'm able to not spar anymore, which is great. I'm really, really happy. I don't want to get punched in the face anyways. Um, you know, I'm I'm able to not be away from my family for such a long time where, you know, yes, I'm still at home during training, but when I miss out on their, on their, their school projects or miss out on giving them a kiss before bedtime or things like that because I'm training, that's what I don't want to miss out on. When my son sits on my lap to hard hard training, he goes, Dad, I miss you. And I'm still in the same house. I'm still under the same roof, but they just got to sleep earlier because my training hours are totally different. I'm not going to miss it. No, I'm not going to miss it. I'm, I'm okay with it. 20 years is like, what else do I have to give? You know, I, I, I could go into something bigger and better now. Um, you know, still stay in shape, but, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly what I want to do or what I'm going to do, but there's just so many avenues for me to do that, uh, 
I'm going to take about a month off and enjoy some fishing. I'm um, enjoying my family mm-hmm. and uh, just go back to the drawing board and find something that I love to do, something that I'm in love with, something that I, not that I have to do, but something that I love to do. I think that's what makes jobs easier. It makes someone's career easier just doing something I love to do. Mm. Obviously, a huge reaction and a lot of people saying thank you on social media to you, a lot of fighters, a lot of peers, uh, you know, showing their respect and thank you, not just for this fight, but obviously the way you paved the way and being a pioneer in the sport. One of the interesting things that came out is that apparently Dana White, there was a text and as I understand, it wasn't to you directly, but it was to your beautiful girlfriend, Amber Nicole Miller. Talk to us about what exactly that text was and sort of what that relationship meant to, you know, you throughout your career with Dana White? You know, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, me and Dana, we were really good friends. You know, we had our differences. We had our dislikes towards each other just for business reasons. And I got a little personal a couple of times. I made a few mistakes because there was another person who was involved in some of the decisions that I probably shouldn't have made. Um, was a la the Dana shirt. Um, yeah. I, the, the, I mean, the text itself was saying um, that was a great job. That's the way he should have gone out on top. And that was the text that he got uh, Amber got from him, which was, uh, it was cool. You know, I think it was yesterday I reached out to him. You know, I reached out and said, thank you for the text. Um, I had to get a response, so maybe he's still mad at me. Can I, can I just <laughs> ask, because one thing that I'm curious about is why didn't he text you? Why Why is he texting Amber yeah, and not you directly? I'm sure he has your number. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, because that's the second time that's happened. The first time that happened was uh, when I signed with Bellator and he sitting, he focused me with his, with his face on it and he says, this yeah. is not going to challenge you, you're nothing well. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just, uh, I mean, Dana likes to hold the cards in his hand always. And I'm cool with it. It is what it is. You know, but bygones are bygones. I'm, I'm going, I'm moving on with my life. Uh, you know, I was in a bad place when me and him were disliked each other. Now I'm in a totally different place in my, my life. Um, I'm a little older, I'm a little wiser. Um, and just make it smarter decisions for my career. Mm. And, you know, at the end of the day, Hey, let bygones be bygones. I'm cool with Dana. I have no problem with him. He was just trying to run his business, and he ran his business great. They're worth four billion dollars now, so he did his job. Um, I did my job for the last 20 years for the fans that, that support me, and I'm very thankful for that. And I had the opportunity through Lorenzo and Frank and Dana um, from the UFC, and of course uh, Scott Coker gave you a meeting job um, with uh, Kevin K from Spike who's uh, been the biggest person behind the whole ever made deal of making the ultimate fighter possible and so forth. But, you know, um, those guys at Spike, I'm very thankful that I give me the opportunity that I have to finish my career the way I think I deserve to be respected. I think my fans deserve it more than me, actually. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, a lot of people looking at this as a situation where there's a rare retirement from a legend on top. We all saw what happened with the BJ Penn last week. A lot of people, I think a lot of fans hurt when they see their favorites sort of go through turmoil and then just sort mm. of disappear. So I think a lot yeah, of people BJ's celebrate not done. that. BJ's going to fight again. BJ's not done. He's fighting again. He's yeah, I mean, uh, he's, he's, since he's, fighting, he's fighting again. He made a mistake and... You know, um, the guy he fought was an animal. The guy's 24 years old, and that's one thing that us fighters, we're stubborn. We're, we're willing to fight anybody, anytime. We don't think about matchmaking. We think about just fighting. That's it. And I, I think BJ, after taking three years off, he should have fought somebody who was, I'm not saying a lower rank, but somebody who had a bigger name and someone who you actually kind of get a warm-up fight. You know, we can't fight the top of our game after taking three years off. There's no way. I mean, look at Chell. You see what you have so You're not going to fight someone in the top tier. I took the three years off. I mean, I'm, I'm in trouble like a joke. I mean, I was, I was, that was easy. That was like all white belt stuff that I did to him, and it was really, really simple to choke him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What did What did you think about the news that came out today about him um, competing against Gary Tonin at the next submission underground three? Um. Well, I, I hope it's at 200 pounds. I mean, Chell is a small guy. Chell's weak. He's not strong at all. I. He felt soft when I, when I got hold of him. I, I knew I had to choke. That's why he was going to go out. He was going to go out or he was going to tap. Because once I got onto him, it was it was done. I'm too big, man. I'm too big, too strong for these 205 pounders. That, 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 that's been my way class in my career, you know. Um, but Chuck got to make his money. got to pay his bills. My bills have been mm-hmm. for a long time, so I'm cool with it. Just finally on Chell, I mean, it looked like Bellator really put a lot of effort and uh, money and uh, future plans into Chael coming into the company and sort of being a draw for them. And a lot of people feel like you sort of walked away with most of the momentum there and a, a lot of fans lost a lot of the interest in seeing uh, Chael fighting, be- as much interest as they had before. Do you think, uh, what do you think of Bellator's future with Sonnen and what they can get out of him now that this fight has sort of happened? 
Oh, they'll get a lot of them. I mean, the guys, the guys want to step in a fight. He wants to fight. Um, mm-hmm. Him and uh, Mandalay Silva, that's an amazing match. You know, he said he'll fight Rampage. He said he'll fight, uh, uh, who was it, a Fyodor. I mean, if he, if he can keep getting in the mat time, that's what it is, getting in the mat time. He can't take three years off and compete against guys at my level. No way. No way. And I said that from the very, very beginning. I mean, I had a lot of guys make a lot of money on my fight, which I was very lucky. And... Um, I, I still think he'll give a great, lots of great fights for Bellator. Bellator, they just uh, not really put all their eggs in one basket with Chell, but they gave me the respect I needed. And um, Chell called me out. These little guys call me out. They don't, they don't win. So it's uh, Chell still has a future. He still has a good future. Uh, I mean, I think you just got to keep doing, putting in the work. This job is something you can't do half ass. You got to both feet in and both feet out. There's no one foot in, one foot out, and it's and expect to win. And that's why. I'm, like I say, 14 weeks I prepare this camp. Mm. 14 weeks, or six, six days a week. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they train three times a day. Tuesday, Thursday, they train four times a day. And Saturday, they train twice for 14 weeks. Wow. I put everything I possibly could. There was not one rock on current through my whole camp. I fought at a D team. I fought at triangles. I fought at a, uh, Kamuras, um I fought on uh, Anacondas. I mean, there was so much that I fought out of during camp. Double legs, single legs, high crotches, snap downs. I mean, so many different things that I fought out of. So I was prepared for this fight. And that's why I think the fight was so easy because I was, I don't want to say over prepared, but I was ready for anything that he had to offer me. I, I knew I had him on his feet. I know I, I get, I'll punch him. And when I hit him with the right hand, he said that dazed me. And I barely even touched him. I went for a kick and I threw a right hand and barely touched him. And I wish I was able to get combinations off him, but. I hit him and I kicked him and then it seemed like he did his front leg wide open. So I was like, huh, double leg or single leg dump. And then it became a little scramble in the same position where we worked at the fit of the chokes. And um, I ended up in half guard where we did all camp. And all of a sudden I just smashed uh, his face down with my right shoulder, pushed the knee down, got him out. I threw one elbow, one punch, another elbow that hit him a little bit. And then he gave his back, his palm hit the mat. And I went for a rear naked choke and I squeezed like, I uh, like it was my last breath. I squeezed so hard. Believe me, I could have sat there for five minutes and kept that squeeze until he was unconscious. Mm. It's it's inspiring hear you talk this way, Tito, because you don't sound like a guy who just retired. You sound like a guy who is having you know a, a career resurgence. So selfishly, it, it's a shame to see you retiring now, especially on such a high. Um, but obviously, we're tremendously happy for you. I think it, now that it's all said and done, now that your career you know has finally come to end, it's probably no better time to sort of look back and what what would you say? You, you've had such a long career, such a story career. What would you say your favorite moments are when you when you look back on everything I'm, I'm sure there's you know so, so many things to look at you know i i can give you my top five i mean um i would say my very first fight fighting against west Alpert and being a little kid who was scared as hell just to get don't make a mistake don't make a mistake don't make a mistake and it's over in 25 seconds and then fighting vandalay silva for the vacant world title and being afraid of vandalay Silva because he was a, the axe murderer and this guy was just knocking wrestlers out of one after another mm. and i beat him in a decision um Frank fighting Frank Shamrock and losing to him and learning what a heart rate monitor was truly about and learning what a true athlete should do during fight camp. Um, Ryan Bader, you know, um, mm. being a six to one underdog and almost knocking him out and then finally getting a kid team choke and choking him unconscious. Um, God, I could have to do more than that, more than five because, you know, um, after, I fought uh, Beto Belfort. There was another one. I got my nose broken in the first round and I finished in a decision um, against a person who was a former champion. Um, and then, of course, this last one where I dom- dominated against someone that was uh, a two-to-one underdog against someone who was supposed to out-wrestle me, someone who was going to throw me around and, and punch me in my face and ground and pound me and, me and embarrass me. He embarrassed me 18 years ago, and I got an opportunity to redeem myself, and I did, and it was – Everything in this world happens for a reason. People got to understand that. And I worked really, really hard through my whole career. And I did it with integrity. I did it with respect. Um, and I could did it by inspiring others. And that's all I've ever wanted to do. In 20 years, I can look back and I'm um, thankful for everything that I have. I'm able to give my children everything I never had as a kid. Um, everything. So it's, 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 it's really, really amazing. I'm, I'm just, I'm thankful. And you, you say that I talk like a regenerative fighter. Um, you know, the only reason I talk like this is because I never had taken much brain damage from fighting in general. You know, I had probably about 25 concussions, but 
this is one of the reasons why I am getting out because I don't want to be that guy who's punished drunk who can't put a sentence together. I refuse to be that person. Mm. I think this my next next uh, step in life is to do you know some television stuff, uh, maybe film some films. Um, I don't know, just just something that that intrigues me and challenges me as a human being on this planet of always mm. giving back. So we'll, we'll, we will see. Yeah, and another great moment was uh, when your son put your gloves down in the middle of that uh, Bellator ring just the weekend. Um, a quick a couple of questions, and we'll let you go. We saw that you got a, a hat from a new president-elect Donald Trump, uh, Make America Great Again. Just curious, did, yeah. have you had a chance to speak to him at all after your win? Have you had any communication with him or his office? Um, no, not yet. Well, actually, with the son, uh, just a little bit. He just congratulated me. He said, great job. I'm really, really proud of you, man. Great, great job, and I'm, wow. I'm, I'm thankful, man. It was, it's pretty cool. It just, it, wow. it's kind of surreal that you know the day before, it just everything seems like it happened for a reason. Everybody happens in threes, you know. Um, I just, I'm waiting for the Super Bowl to get over with. Because the Super Bowl, then it'll be happening in threes, and that's when the Patriots win. <laughs> That'll be my <laughs> third one because Trump winning was my first one. Me winning was my second one, and the Patriots will be winning my third. But uh, you know. It, at the wands when I put on that Make America Great hat again, um, it just shows the respect and the support that I give towards uh, Mr. Trump, our president. I, I, I believe in his dream of what he wants to do for our country, and he wants to be the best president alive. And um, this is my choice, my freedom of speech, that I could do this thing. And I don't see myself as a politician. I don't see myself as a celebrity, but just a person who cares about his family and cares about his country and wants to do the best thing for it. And that's to spread the word of uh, Mr. Trump of making America great again. And then after winning, I put that hat on. And I took a picture and I sent it. I just, I, I do it from the bottom of my heart. I don't care what people say. You know, people say, oh, you're Mexican. You shouldn't do that. Well, I know a lot of Mexicans that support Mr. Trump and um, lots of um, ethnic backgrounds that support Trump. People see what he's truly about. And I, I've been able to work with him. I've seen, I've seen what type of person he is. And I respect him like no other. Well, there he is, guys. I mean, what else is there to say? All we can really say, Tito, is, is thank you so much. Thank you for obviously giving us your time countless times. Thank you for an amazing career. Um, I, d I don't think the show is long enough to really pay proper tribute to you, but um, thank you so much for taking the time to to speak to us today, and and congratulations on you know not just the weekend but a phenomenal career, guys. Don't forget to follow him, obviously, and as he continues the journey on Twitter at Tito Ortiz, and of course Instagram at Tito Ortiz nineteen ninety nine. Tito, thank you. And yeah, I, 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 I've been doing a lot of things on my Instagram uh, live. I've been uh, going live on the answer a lot of questions. Uh, I think we had up to about 16,000 people day before last. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, people want got questions they want to know. Um, just top of my Instagram, that's Tito Ortiz, 1999. And I'm usually on, you know, in the night times. It's, it's, it's therapy for me. I get to explain my side of a lot of things that people always want to make for me. Beautiful. Well, Tia, we really appreciate the time. Thanks again, and congratulations on an amazing career. Enjoy retirement, and we can't see, we can't wait to see what's next. Thank you again. Awesome, man. Thank you, guys. Everybody in Australia, I appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Hope you guys uh, enjoyed my career of 20 years uh, as an MMA fighter. There will only be one, Tito Ortiz, that's for sure, and I, I think I did it the right way. Thank you guys so much. Hey, guys, this is Brian Stan. You're listening to Submission Radio. All right, guys. Our next guest will be fighting at UFC 209 on March 4th, where he will face Tyron Woodley for the welterweight belt in a rematch of their amazing November battle at UFC 205. He was also most recently seen imitating Conor McGregor, Leota Machida, and others in a game, a classic game of charades. The UFC's Karate Kid, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Welcome back to Submission Radio. How's it going today, Stephen? Doing great, man. Doing great. Good old sunshine in South Carolina. Staying on that grind for UFC 209. Mm. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> this is something right here. Did you come up with this just now, or is this something you were planning overnight because you knew you were going to do this interview? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I literally just off the off wow. the top, man, right here. I'm actually, right, believe it or not, um, just got done picking up kids from school for our after-school program at Upstate. Still on the bus, getting ready to head, head on the inside. So, man, I'm, I'm all smiles, bro. I appreciate you guys having me on. Well, that's amazing, and it's also amazing that here you are with a huge, huge fight on your hands, and there's you're doing all this awesome stuff, working with the kids. And I, you know what? I wish, I wish I was one of those kids get doing this uh, this program. It sounds amazing, but let's touch on this charades for a second. With everything that's going on between you and Tyron, what was it like playing charades together, teaming up, 
try and take out that pesky team of Kenny Florian and DC. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was actually getting, you know, we were together all day. We were in L.A. Uh, doing interview after interview after interview. And it was a good way to kind of mix things up and kind of get us both relaxed. And it was the end of the day. And we both were kind of a little tired of doing the, uh, you know, interviews and answering the same questions. And so DC and Kenny Florian, we decided to do some charades just to have a little fun and mix it up, you know. Mm-hmm. But it was fun, man. We were, me and Tyron were on the same team. Um, again, so obviously DC and Kenny Florian, we, we had a good time. It was fun. Yeah, it was it was fun for us watching obviously the the progression of those interviews and then you know going into those charades as well to sort of cap it off. Got to ask though, you were pretty good, but if you had to choose one game to take Tyron on uh, for all the marbles, which one would you choose out of the following options, Stephen? We've got musical chairs, we've got carrying an egg on a spoon race, or a three-legged race where you and Tyron get to choose a partner of your choice. Of course, all games that are very much to do with you know your MMA training. Well, to be honest with you, uh, I think I could defeat him in all three of them. Oh, wow. <laughs> all three. I think I could take him all three, man. But I am, I got to say, I'm a master at musical chairs. Oh, really? Uh, I'm a musical chairs master. That's right. I'm quick, man. I kind of anticipate when they're going to cut the music off. Boom. And I'm, and I'm, I'm in a chair, bro. It's, it's very difficult to beat me. I have yet to lose a game of mu- musical chairs. Just saying. Wow. All, all the kids are in the bus right now listening, going, all right, the challenge is on. I'd like to see you guys do the egg on a spoon race. I think that would draw pay-per-view numbers. But just curious, <laughs> who would be your dream partner for a three-legged race? If you could choose anyone in the world, who would you choose? You can't, well, the can't one be person... anyone like your dad or anything like that. We want something cool. Okay, so no relatives then. No relatives. No, no relatives. Huh. <laughs> well, if, if it was me... I would pick somebody smaller, but just as athletic, just in case he ends up like twisting an ankle, I can pick him up and take off running. So I would go for uh, Bruce Lee. Ooh, well, there you go. Bruce Lee that would be, be awesome. He'd be a, he would be a solid partner, I believe. Two uh, two two masters of their craft. Um, yeah, that, that'd be something. <laughs> and and I, I feel a bit slighted because just like you, Stephen, I'm actually undefeated in the three legged race. So a bit of a missed uh-oh, opportunity there, uh-oh. but uh, it's well, really, well, really, well, something building well, up. Sounds here, like right? a competition. <laughs> sounds like a little competition. <laughs> uh, look, I'd, I'd pick Bruce Lee as well. All right, so let's let's get into this because before UFC 205, the big question was, and we had you on the show many times, so you know, we're very familiar with this. But the big question was whether or not you would get that next title shot, and recently. It's kind of been the same question all over again, you know, with Tyron stating that he didn't feel the, feel the need to do the rematch immediately. Were you sort of at all surprised that you seemingly had to work so hard uh, to get this immediate rematch? And also, why do you think he was reluctant to do this fight straight away? Well, to be honest with you, I really, um, to be honest, I didn't have to work too hard to actually get this fight. I know he was talking about other people, you know, Conor McGregor and Nick Diaz, George St. Pierre, even going up a weight class fight in Bisbing. But I felt like, you know, obviously, uh, if it's a draw, you always run it back and you do it again. You know, he was talking about right after the fight, we had an unfinished business. And so I found it kind of funny that he was talking about other fighters other than me. Because, you know, if I was the champion and if it was me, I wouldn't feel right or be satisfied with a draw. You know, it's just kind of like, uh, you know, I got the, I didn't win. I'll take the, tr- I'll take the belt home as like a, what a uh, participation trophy, I guess you could say. Mm. So, I mean, I always felt that it was going to happen, but in literally all I, I actually got the contract to fight him in December, early December before Christmas break. And, um, so I signed it, didn't ask for anything, didn't renegotiate any numbers or anything. Signed it and sent it right back. And, um, um, so literally he was talking about all these, all these guys and so all I did was I posted a picture up of me and Tyron on social media with my signature on the contract. And I said, waiting <laughs> on you. And I, it must have really hit a nerve with him. He ended up signing, uh, signing the contract that week. I know he had the contract, just mm-hmm. hadn't signed it yet. So, it, you know, I, to be honest, I really didn't have to work that hard. I kind of felt that it was going to happen. I heard the the way he explained it was that I guess he was having a bit of fun on on Twitter and he wanted and he wanted to sign it, announce it on his podcast, which I believe I believe it's Morning Wood and and D's Nuts, and he sort of felt yeah. like you jumped the gun. But something I just want to clarify because <laughs> you mentioned that you didn't send the contract back immediately. Just just curious why that was, unless I misheard you. No, no, yeah, I, I did send it. Oh, I, you I did. signed okay. it and sent it right. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had no idea he was gonna. Um, 
Uh, he told me actually when we were on our little media tour we had last week that he I had jumped the gun and he was actually going to sign it and, and and obviously talk about it. And so that was my. I had no idea. Next time he needs to send me like a, you know, something to let me know what's going on. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> I had no idea he was going to do that. But you know what? It is what it is. And uh, we're going to be fighting um, you know, November. Uh, excuse me, March fourth. Uh, mm-hmm. And and a big card as well. I mean, a lot of people looking forward to this card. I mean, you mentioned uh, the media tour, and uh, there's a, there was a couple of good back and forths between you and Ty. And there was one moment in particular where he called you entitled for believing you deserve this rematch. What, what were your thoughts when he said that? You know what? I, I laughed whenever I, I, I read that because there's not an entitled bo- uh, bone in my body. I, I didn't actually beg for this fight. You know, after the fight, I was back in training because I know he told he even said we had unfinished business, and I got the contract. I didn't even ask the UFC for it or anything. They sent it to me, and I signed it and sent it right back. So I don't understand where he was coming from, uh, uh, him saying that, you know, I, I, you know, me being entitled. If anything, it seems like he's entitled because he feels what, you know, uh, you know, begging for the money fight, asking all these guys trying to ride on these other these other fighters' coattails to get uh, a big fight, a big money fight. But um, yeah, it, it, I thought it was just funny, man, for for him to say that. We got to ask you, Stephen, and, and I know that you were sort of asked about this in this media tour, but it feels like the story's kind of been building and, and building, and obviously he was on the MMA Hour recently, so, and I also feel like every time you've been asked this question, someone's cut you off, whether it's whether it's been Tyron or an interview or someone, but obviously there's the case that, you know, he's spoken about being the worst treated champion in the UFC histories and you know, alluding that it's been because of race. Something that he's saying for a while now, I'm, even in hating into the first fight, I'm just wondering, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, man, you know, to be honest, the guy hasn't been champion long enough to, to, to even feel that way, I believe. I mean, to me, it seems like the, word, the, the, the most hated champion would be uh, Bisping, you know what I mean? Um... um you know, for me, he, he hasn't defended the title uh, uh, like he's supposed to. Um, so, you know, automatically, you know, getting that rematch and just uh, looking for other fighters and, and riding on other people's coattails may, maybe have given him uh, or the fans a, a bad taste in their mouth. But um, when it comes to race, uh, that's stupid. I mean, that's, that, that's just stupid. Uh, you know, one of the highest paid athletes in the UFC is John Jones. Mm-hmm. And pretty much whatever happened to him, what he did to himself. And um, Anderson Silva, on the other hand, too. So I, I don't get it. And you know what? It, it kind of irritates me because he's focused on that when he should be focusing uh, uh, more on the fight at hand. Because I don't want to. I don't want to step out there uh, March fourth and face off against a distracted Tyron Woodley. You know, I fight for the honor and the, and the glory, and I want to fight the best when I step out there March uh, March fourth. And I want him to be focused on it. So um, that's 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 my two cents on that. And I just think it's ridiculous. Mm-mm. I mean, he's but on made the other a... hand, but yeah, but on sorry, the other hand, I, I still, I'm sorry. Um, I, I don't see what goes on on his point of view whenever, you know, he's negotiating with the UFC. Mm-hmm. Of course, I'm not, I'm not there with him during those negotiations or things like that. So maybe, uh, I don't know, I'm missing something or maybe, I don't know. He said, he sees something different just because I'm not there, uh, during his negotiations and, and chats with the UFC. I don't know, but, um, but for my side, you know, for him to to, to, to pull that, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's not necessary. Mm-hmm. And I mean, he made it clear that he doesn't consider you a racist at all, and also that he doesn't expect you to understand what he's been going through. But he pointed exactly, to the UFC yeah. 205 promotion being unfair and making making him out like he was the challenger. In the lead up to that fight, did you in any way feel like you were being promoted more than him or disproportionately compared to him? Uh, to be honest, I, I don't think so. I, I know the fans were more on my side because mm. of um, him denying me. You remember when I called him out on Fox? I was the number mm. one contender at the time. Um, and we were supposed to make that happen. And he immediately was asking for a money fight. And now, you know, of course, now he's saying, oh, it's not about the money. But, you know, from what he has said, it is. And I think the fans kind of kind of uh, uh, saw that and – like I said, maybe put a bad taste in their mouth and, um, you know, was kind of rooting against them during the fight. So maybe that's where he's getting all that from. Maybe not from the UFC, but from the fans. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, that's that's what I see. 
I'm, I'm wondering, because the funny thing about you apparently being promoted more or in, in any way favoured is that according to Tyron, and this is via Luke Thomas, uh, the UFC originally offered the fight to Nick Diaz as opposed to yourself, who allegedly turned it down due to monetary reasons. I'm just wondering, how, how do you feel about the UFC potentially offering Nick the fight first instead of doing that immediate rematch with you? Did you hear anything about that? And um, did, did you have any sort of reaction I heard, when you heard? Yeah, I heard rumors that that had happened, and it... And it, and it might have um maybe i don't know I, I understand the ufc kind of puts those things out there just in case uh maybe maybe you know, a fighter couldn't, couldn't make it because i'm because you know after my fight i was injured had lacerations on my face uh um i was pretty banged up and asking for a little bit of time to heal up so they had different options mm. so that way they would have different options but um once i had gotten the contract i sent it right in and i guess that that um Maybe it happened. I know Nick Diaz was asking for more money, uh, things like that. But, you know, and from my point of view, you know, of course, Dana White was saying right after the fight that we're going to have an immediate rematch. And so I wasn't too worried. But mm. then whenever, you know, Tyron was started to call on these other fighters. And, um, and of course, I heard the rumor that Nick Diaz got the uh, got, you know, was asked to fight Tyron again. That's when I put that tweet out. And, um, you know, of course, things happen after that. But. You know, it, it is what it is, and I understand why the UFC probably did that for a backup, but um, that's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. And a very nice strategic move there with a the tweet. Last time you told us about how you found out about the official, the first fight, UFC 205, talk to us about how you found out about headlining UFC 209 this time. How did you find out? Was it through a parent at the dojo again? Is this parent breaking news <laughs> all over the place again? <laughs> how, how exactly did you find this out? Um, it was, it was actually during no way. karate classes. Karate what, was classes. it the same yeah, parent? <laughs> it wasn't the same parent. It was. I thought you had like it an was... Ariel Hawani type parent in the class. <laughs> it's just like breaking news to UFC tonight. Just sitting there with an earpiece while you teach the no, class. No, no, there, oh, there, I know, there, man. There's a roster of parents who are, who are breaking news to you. <laughs> there is a lot of UFC fans here in South Carolina and most of them come from our gym. You know, a lot of mm. excited parents glad, you know, a UFC fighter is training their kids and, uh, so they're always on social media looking things up, and believe it or not, it was right after the class. The parent says, "Hey, it's going, it's, it's happening." I just listened to, to Tyron, um, you know, tweet it out. It was on his uh, his uh, podcast, and um, so it's going to happen. So that right there, I, that's how I found out. Really, I didn't have a chance to go to my phone, and I usually do that obviously after after classes are done, and and it's fairly late. So one of the parents got to it first, let me let me in on it, and man, I was all smiles after that. Wow. Well, this is good because now we know where the media needs to congregate for all their breaking news. We just hang out at, at Stephen Thompson's jo dojo and uh, we'll, That's we'll right, be getting man. scoops. <laughs> this, this first fight, uh, Stephen, obviously on an unbelievably massive card in, in UFC 2.5. It was an event in itself with a lot of attention on it. You know, it was, it was the first show in Madison Square Garden, the first show in New York. You were essentially treated like a hometown hero there. I know you mentioned that the moment kind of got to you a little bit on the night. Mentally, how, do you, how different do you think it'll be fighting on this card in Vegas? Well, you know, immediately after the fight, I, um, and I knew going into this next fight, I was going to be more confident. Obviously, you know, I don't like to make excuses or anything like that. I performed mm. the way I performed. It wasn't a hundred percent. I wasn't all there mentally. I think I was a little hesitant walking around really light and that kind of bothered me a little bit why I wasn't getting the weight like I, like I should have, uh, against a bigger, uh, Tyron Woodley. But, um, you know, I sat there and I and think, why did I not let my hands go? You know, what was going on? And maybe it could have been, you know, Chris Weidman watching him being defeated the way it happened. Um, I don't think so because I'm a professional. I know that I was up next and I've had fighters fight before me and it didn't go very well. But, you know, even then, you know, having one of your best friends, that happened to him. It is kind of devastating. But uh, it could have been the hype of the whole event. I'm not sure. But... You know, going into this next fight, knowing that the last fight I wasn't a hundred percent, and still took the best Tyron Woodley all five rounds, took his best shot, his best submission, and still and helped him up off the canvas after that fourth round. It gives me the confidence to go in that uh, next fight and just and just let it all out. You know, um, obviously we both felt each other. I know his timing. He's he's felt me a little bit, but he still hasn't seen everything that I can throw. 
Mm. You know, if you go back and watch my previous fights, I throw more volume. There's more kicks, different angles, and I just didn't do that in my last fight. So um, there's still some things that he's got to watch out for, and that also gives me the confidence going into this next fight as well. Yeah, it's interesting that you mention that. I mean, like you said, you felt him out. You've been in the ring with him for a significant amount of rounds. So when you do think about this fight in your head, is this a five-round battle that's going to be back and forth and close? Or because you sort of know what you're dealing with this time, do you expect it to be a much shorter fight this time around UFC 209? You know, uh, whatever happens, happens. I don't like going out there thinking that I'm going to finish this guy right off the bat because you end up going out there trying to do that, and then you wear yourself out or it doesn't happen, and it can, it can mess you up mentally. So I prepare myself for a five, five in a round war, just like the last time, you know, just because I know he's going to be better. And, and, I, and I look at every opponent that way. If the knockout happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But you will see a bigger, better, faster Stephen Winterboy Thompson come March 4th. Wow. And just on that sort of bigger Stephen Thompson, you told us last time that you felt like you came in a bit too light and how Tyron felt stronger than, uh, you know, some of the light heavyweights you trained with. With a bit over a month away, what have you been doing differently to sort of come in heavier? And how much heavier do you, do you expect to be in this fight? Because I know some people looking at these interviews that you were doing recently are already talking about, wow, you know, Stephen Thompson looked bigger. And they've talked about your neck, how your neck looks a lot thicker as well. Well, what I, I actually I stopped using a strength and conditioning coach for like the past six fights after the Matt Brown fight. Wow! And and it just kind of um, didn't sit well with me. I was kind of doing my own thing, and uh, I hired a very explosive guy, more specific training, uh, sport specific training, uh, and I saw the result. Actually, one of my sparring partners was using this guy, and when we would spar and we would do jujitsu, I could feel how much more powerful, how much more explosive and faster he was. So I decided to give this guy a shot, and we're doing more sport-specific stuff, uh, explosive movements, um, things like that, which is going to make me faster out there. Obviously, I'm not you know, uh, putting the right fuel in my body for this camp has also helped me heal. And, of course, the faster the body heals, the more it grows. And I'm trying not to get over 195. I'm about 190 right now. I'm going to stay right there. Want to get? don't want to get too high because I know the dramatic cuts – uh, from that weight, so it's a little bit more rough. Mm. Of course, Tyron's used to that. He's been wrestling his entire life, so he knows what his body can, is capable of. I'm still fairly new at this weight cutting thing, so um, which is one of the reasons I was walking around so light before because it was just such an easier cut. Um, so I'm not trying to get too too heavy, but big enough to where you know I can handle his power, his his bi- his big thick size, um, you know, out there in the fight. Because my last fight, I was I literally weighed myself before I stepped out there. I was 178, and I know he was probably close to back up to 200. And when you're that much, where there there's that much of a spread, it definitely matters out there in those clinch positions. So uh, not trying to get too crazy big, but man, do I feel much faster, much more explosive than I did last time. Yeah, well, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays into the next fight. I mean, you've told us on the show before about how your real job is teaching kids karate and, you know, how you enjoy fighting, but, you know, you want to set an example for your students. I know that you mentioned you don't really see a fight going a particular way and you like to just go in there and feel it out. But for the sake of the program, I have to ask you, on March 4th, when you do get another chance to achieve that goal, what's the official prediction? I mean, I know... You must visualize different outcomes. What's the one that comes to your mind most often? How do you see yourself getting the win? You know, every time I step out, that doesn't matter. You know, I started doing this, you know, early in my kickboxing days. I never go out there visualizing the finish, but I always visualize my hand raised at the end of that fight. And just seeing that and visualizing that, man, makes me train so much harder in the gym and helps me stay focused on what I need to do at hand. And that step out there and do a great performance, not just for the UFC, but for the fans and for myself and everybody who helped me get to where I am. You know, I've got sparring partners and coaches who sacrifice their time, sacrifice their bodies for the sparring. uh, And I just don't want to do it for myself. I want to do it for them. So I always visualize my hand being raised at the end of that fight with that belt around my waist. Well, you know, something else that you can look forward to in March and we can look forward to talking to you about and I'm not talking about the fight, but the release of the Power Rangers movie, which is <laughs> going to happen a little bit I later that month. So imagine Man. this. Imagine <laughs> this. You win the title on the, four, on the 4th of March, and then you take that bad boy with you to the cinema with your students and watch Power Rangers on the 23rd of March. And then, of course, right afterwards, we'll have to get you on to get not, – not talk about the belt. Forget about the belt. Not talk about <laughs> the win. Who cares about the win? Talk about your review of the Power Rangers movie because that's going to be some important stuff to discuss. 
Oh, definitely, man, because I was right there when Power Rangers first started. I've always been a big, big <laughs> Power Ranger fan. Can't wait for this movie to come out now. I'm looking forward to, to talking to you guys about it. Oh, man, we, we always look forward to speaking to you, Steven, so it's going to be a lot of fun. But before the Grand Power Rangers movie, of course, you'll be taking on Tyron Woodley in the main event of UFC 209. What a, what a special moment that's going to be. Uh, and that's, of course, going to be in March 4th in Las Vegas at the beautiful T-Mobile Arena. For those here in Australia, of course, due to the time difference, it is going to be March 5th here on main event on pay-per-view. And you guys can follow Steven Wonderboy Thompson on Twitter and Instagram at Wonderboy MMA, check out that new explosive training. Stephen, we thank you for your time, and uh, it, it is always a pleasure chatting to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, guys. Y'all have a good one. And there you guys have it. Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Can't wait to see what his Power Ranger review is going to be like. Very interested mm. to see this rematch at UFC 209 between him and Tyron Woodley. Excited to see what the outcome of that's going to be. But, I mean, a lot of stuff happening last week or this week with uh, the media tour that they've been doing. They went around to a few different outlets, such as ESPN. Obviously, Woodley was on the MMA Hour earlier this week. And and the big recurring topic that came out of a lot of these uh, media appearances and uh, from some of the stuff that Woodley said was in, indeed to do with racism in the sport and also the perception of fans towards him in the sport as well, the treatment that he's had from fans and just the overall racism in the sport of MMA and the UFC. Um, he spoke about it on ESPN. He was on Ariel Hawani's show and opened up a bit more about it. So we thought, hey, this is a pretty big topic and we have to address it on the program. We know everybody's thinking about it, talking about it at the moment and sort of give our opinion and take on it. Uh, th there's a bit to unpack, Cass. So there's a couple mm -hmm. of sides to it. There's a few things to talk about. I mean, where should we sort of kick this off? All right, so I'll sort of give you my opening introduction and thoughts. I mean, when Tyron said these things, my ears pricked up. It's something that I'm interested in. It's something I'm curious about. And mm -hmm. everything that I say, I'll just preface it with this. I'm a white guy living in Australia. I couldn't possibly know, you know, what Tyron's gone through, what he's experienced. And that's, I guess, one of the reasons why I'm interested. Also, before I sort of you know, if, if, if this is as bad as what Tyron is saying, I'm happy to support anyone who's doing it tough. But before I do that, I really wanted to understand what exactly is happening. And I felt like through some of the interviews, I, I felt like Tyron was being somewhat vague with his examples and, and sort of listing what had happened. And I, I was hoping because he said that he was going to be on the MMA hour and that he was going to drop bombs and uncover everything and, and blow the lid off this thing. I really wanted to hear him give examples about racism and how it's affected his career. I wanted something along the lines of, all right, January 1st, this is what happened. I had communications or I had an interaction with this person. They worked for the UFC or they were from a sponsor company or something or whatever. This is how the interaction went down. This is why it affected me as a black person. This is why I feel like it was because of race. And this is how it's affected my career. And someone like me who may be a bit ignorant or in the dark about these things can look at that and go, wow, like I had no idea that you were going through these things. And I, I'm mm -hmm. still kind of waiting for that. I feel like even through his appearance on the MMA hour, some of the examples were a bit vague. He talked about things that had happened, but that he wasn't going to speak about, but he, he had overcome. So I'm not going to really speak about the things that I don't know about, but I will look at it from an MMA fan and a you know MMA analyst, if you want to really call me that. I, I don't know much about race is what he's been through but i do know about the sport and mma fighters careers so before i go into that dennis wh what did you think what was your sort of initial reaction it was one of those things i think i was in a similar similar boat to you where when it came to examples of how uh he was being held down on this in the sport or how fans perceived him differently because of his race um he didn't really give as many examples so i could sort of really understand his perspective on it i do understand however though Obviously, through social media, people mm -hmm. say horrible things all the time. I mean, they're not racist to us per se, but we get very interesting comments from time to time on social media saying a whole bunch of crazy stuff. And I mean, mm. if you're in the public's eye like Woodley is, um, I, there are some people that would take that low road and say some, some really nasty stuff racially, which I completely understand would be very, very hurtful. But when it comes to the uh, a biggest perspective of how he was being held down in the sport or how um, he was being treated differently as a champion who was an African-American. I didn't really see those examples, and I'm, I'm still trying to understand it and unpack it. Well, I mean, so I guess there's kind of two things. Like, if, if he's talking about, all right, I am being bashed on social media for my race, 
All right. I absolutely agree that he should say that. And I think regardless, he should speak his mind. But if he's going to say that it's affecting his career, I feel like there needs to be some kind of direct correlation. Mm -hmm. As some of the things like, okay, th this is what I want to talk about. Like some of the examples he gave were the whole muscles and, and cardio thing. You know, him being called a freak athlete, right? And and in some way to him that ties into racism. And I, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't really see it because I think if you call somebody a freak athlete, you're basically saying they have exceptional athletic abilities. And he said that, look, that undermines the hard work that I've put in. I'm not just someone who, who was born athletically with genetics. I've worked extremely hard all my life. And I kind of look at that and think, well, when someone calls you a freak athlete, they're not disputing or undermining whether you worked hard or not. Like Chad Mendes, that's a guy that's been always called a freak athlete because he is, you know, he's strong, he's explosive, he's quick, he's got cardio, all these kinds of things. Brock Lesnar's another guy that comes to mind, which is kind of funny mm. talking about him now, given that what he's just recently gone through with, with the failed drug test. But regardless of how he got his, you know, athletic ability, he is a freak athlete. Anytime you listen to Joe Rogan talk about Brock Lesnar, you hear him talk again and again about what a freak athlete he is. And he really is. And if you look at Tyra Woodley, I think he fits the bill. He's unbelievably quick. He has crazy knockout power. He is explosive. I'm not saying that in a cliche way. The way he covers distance is truly impressive. Um, he's unbelievably muscular. And he proved in the Wonder Boy fight that, you know, he does have cardio. If that's not a freak athlete, I, I don't know what is. So... To me, I don't think it undermines anything. And I also just don't see how in any way that's racist to call someone a freak athlete. Um, the other thing is, you know, he, he gets bothered by people talking about his big muscles and questioning whether he's, he has cardio. I think if you're a guy who has, you know, historically looking at it, uh, Woodley went to the championship rounds once before 205 and he got knocked out in the fourth round. I, I think it's completely fair to at least question whether he has cardio or not. I don't see too many people saying, Willie doesn't have cardio, he's got shit cardio. I just see a lot of people saying, does he have cardio? We will see. I, I don't see how in any way that has anything to do with race. I mean, I, I, I watch, I watch you know, fighters in Europe and in Bosnia and things like that on regional shows, and they look like bodybuilders who decided to give MMA a go. And more often than not, they have terrible cardio. I think any time that you have large muscles, people are always going to question it. So I, I don't really see, you know, the racism there. What do you think, Dennis? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. And I think whether it's guys like Tim Kennedy or many other guys mm. who have a lot of muscle in the UFC, it, you know, and, it, and it's tough because, look, we're not in America amongst maybe some circles, but from everything I understand, from all the fans we've spoken to, and I mean, we have fans from all around the world and, and the traveling that we've done, every time we've spoken about this issue, it, it's more universally sort of physically uh, from a medical perspective and not in a scientific perspective. I, like, I have never honestly um, heard anybody say, hey, look, this guy uh, you know, is is a freak athlete because of his race. I mean, I've never heard it in the sport of MMA. I, 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 people have said, oh, okay, well, this guy's a freak athlete. Look at his brothers, look at his sisters. We've, we've had families like Luke Rockhold, for example, comes from a very athletic family. Mm. I think his father was an athlete. He's an athlete. Um, I think his brother's a surfer. Mm -hmm. and, you look at, and I mean, I think that's how people tie these things together. We look at it scientifically from what we understand. And I, I, you know, I haven't honestly uh, been around people that sort of can put race into the subject, and I, I've never really sort of thought about it from that perspective until sort of Woodley really brought it up. So I'm sort of in the same boat with you, Casper. When I look at a guy with big muscles, I go, "Hey, this guy may have trouble with cardio." When I, when I see a guy with the ability that he has, a Brock Lesnar has, a lot of these other guys have, I go, "Hey, this guy is 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 a natural athlete. He's able to do things that even if." For example, I'm an example of a guy who's not a natural athlete. I'll work at something for ages, and then maybe I'll get good at that one little thing, but my execution, my ability to do certain things, I mean, I just don't have that natural athletic ability. And I think it's really clear, especially for guys like myself who don't have that ability, you know, what a natural athlete looks like. Yeah, but I, I think it's also the fact that he gets called a freak athlete. Like, let's say you dedicated yourself for years and transformed yourself, Dennis, and, and you know, you, you look like a beast, you were a beast, you know, you, you were quick and explosive and all these kinds of things. Like, if I was to say Dennis is a freak athlete, I, I, I don't... I'm, I'm assuming you wouldn't look at that and, and say to me, like, hey, man, I worked hard. You know, you would just kind of say, like, yeah, I am, I am a freak athlete. It's not like I'm taking anything away from you and saying you were born like this. Yeah, yeah. I think – and I also – and that's where I don't really see it coming from a racial perspective. I think if you did say, oh, I'm a freak athlete, I would personally take it as a compliment. I think that's 
possibly a, a like a, that's a really really nice thing you can say about somebody but even if he was taking it out of context and sort of thinking okay people are saying i'm a freak athlete and i don't actually work at it i'm still sort of struggling to make that racial connection there mm-hmm. and i guess that's that's what you're bringing up that's 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 the sort of point that you're making and, and i definitely agree with that point right the other thing that he mentioned was um he spoke about he he listed Demetrius Johnson and John Jones as fighters and sort of spoke about where they're you know why aren't they getting the big mm. endorsements and things like that. That's another thing that like and again all these things I'm not saying Tyron's wrong. I'm not saying I disagree with him. I'm just saying I don't see what he's really talking about. Like you look at a guy like Demetrius Johnson. Before Reebok came in, he was sponsored by Xbox. That's a big endorsement. I don't know of any other mm. fighter that was sponsored by Xbox. John Jones was sponsored by Nike. John Jones was sponsored by Gatorade. And before those, I remember when there was a big deal about who is John Jones going to be sponsored by, who's he going to choose, and he chose the UFC, and the UFC were the ones sponsoring him. Um, I think if you look at Demetrius Johnson, and I, I look, I agree with him in in the sense that Demetrius Johnson is underappreciated. I think he doesn't get the des- the respect that he deserves. I don't think he gets the money that he deserves, and and you know the the promotion as well, but. I don't think it's anything to do with race. I think that Demetrius' issue, and I'm not saying it's his fault in any way, I just think like the way that the, the casual fans work. I put it this way, I remember going with with friends to the UFC years ago, casual fans, and them saying things like, oh, that Demetrius Johnson and Ian McCall, those, it's like watching kids fight. I could throw those guys around, right? And, you know, mm-hmm. unfortunately, that kind of ignorance, it's slow to go away. I think the fact that they're in lighter weight classes makes it tough. The other thing is that you know, Demetrius Johnson, he's such a smart sort of like even keel guy. He never, ever buys into trash talk. Uh, we've had him on many times and he say like, hey, Dodson said this about you. Cejudo said this about you. And he always steers away from it. And he's like, well, I expect them to, you know, think they can beat me because they're championship level fighters. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But at the same time, to the casual fan, that's not something that's going to garner clicks. And and that, as we've seen last year, the biggest uh, the biggest pay-per-views were, you know, the McGregor-Diaz fights. No titles on the line. It was based purely on the rivalry. You just don't see that with Demetrius Johnson. And uh, as far as John Jones goes, I mean... I, th- I think it's very easy to argue that John Jones, anytime he's, you know, impeded his career or anything sort of slowed down or any kind of opportunity that's fallen through, it's not really because of lack of promotion. I don't think it's a race thing. I mean, DUIs and, and, and things like that, the guy really did it to himself. So again, those are two examples that I just, I don't see that racial connection. I think it's a bit of a cop out to just say, look, they're not where they should be because of race. Yeah, yeah. And no, I totally agree with that. And I mean, we're even seeing it a little bit in the heavyweight division, um, the, one of the biggest divisions in the UFC, mm. hampered by injury and the fact that it's a lot of rematches. You don't really have as much excitement from a casual fan perspective. You know, you got Steve Pace, champion, and people have lost a little bit of interest in that division. And when, when you look at what happened there, and that is the, those are the biggest guys, it, it's easy to understand why the flyweight division is having so much trouble with, with all the facts that you said and plus the fact that they don't have like a Conor McGregor in there doing what Conor's done in the featherweight division. I mean, when he went into the featherweight division, uh, not that many people appreciate Jose Aldo and a lot of the fighters in there now that he was champion there and spent his time there, that was a lot more popular of a division. So I believe that it's definitely not race related what, what's going on with Demetrius Johnson. I agree with yourself that he is, uh, you know, we should be getting paid more. Should be more fans should know who he is. But I do really believe it's a size thing and a fact that there's a lack of competitors there. And I think John Jones, that's right. I mean, he is the biggest example of that. I mean, if anything, John Jones has gotten more passes from the UFC than many other fighters. Mm. It's it's just it's never it's never been race related to me of, he, of how well a fighter a star, does. John Jones. He's still a star. I mean, you could argue no matter what the race of, of another fighter, if they did what John Jones half of the things that John Jones did and they weren't a, as big of a draw as John Jones, they'd be long gone from the UFC and possibly mm. the MMA career al- already over. So yeah, when it comes to building a star and and, and MMA, I mean, I, to me personally, race has, has never really played a factor into that whatsoever. People just buy into the fact that certain people are captivating, certain people have that X factor, and it's never really been about the race. Well, it's funny because you know you you look at Conor McGregor, and I mean he he's white as snow, but even he faces racism. Like, and and it's almost like. 
it's almost more publicly acceptable. Like if you were to say something about an African American in a press conference, Jesus, you, you would be shot down in flames, and rightfully so. But how often do you see people say things like, "Oh, you know, Leprechaun" or "Luck of the Irish" or "Lucky Charms" or things like that, and everybody just kind of rolls with it. Now, I'm not trying to compare, you know, racism to say, you know, you know what what black people have gone through or what Irish people have gone through, but I'm just saying, like Conor McGregor, or I'm just saying, everybody sort of goes through that. Everybody has their own sort of brand of racism that they face, which I think is unfortunate and I think is deplorable. But, you know, sort of going back to Demetrius Johnson, if he had the same personality of Conor McGregor and if he talked trash and things like that, I guarantee you he would not necessarily be as big a star, but he'd definitely be making a lot more money than than Conor McGregor is. And listen, from Tyron Woodley's perspective, the complaints that I have seen from fans and people on social media and forums and things like that, their issue is more with other things about Tyron. I, I don't see people say, you know, oh, it's it's because it's Tyron's, you know, an African-American. I see people, I, I put it this way, I know fans were rubbed wrong when the Hector Lombard fight didn't come through. And a lot of people thought, well, why doesn't he want to fight Hector Lombard? I know a lot of people were rubbed wrong by the fact that he was on the sidelines for a while, and then he ended up getting the title shot. Wonderboy Thompson mentioned before about the the sort of Fox interview where he spoke about money fights and things like that, even though he just won the title. And it's interesting that he says about the, the big endorsements, because you can look at Robbie Lawler, the previous champion, and say the exact same thing. Where was Robbie Lawler's endorsements? Where were his big deals? Where where was his incredible push and, and incredible money? So, yeah, I don't know. Look, put, put it this way. I do agree with Tyron on one thing, and that is that he's asking for a bigger push from the company. And I'm all for that. In a time where rivalries and personalities are being pushed over champions, I am all for a champion saying, you know what? I want to be pushed more. I want more opportunities. I want more, you know, time, promote my champ camp and my champ life. So in that sense, I can get behind him. And I'm also kind of, whether, whether I agree with Tyron or not, I'm kind of glad that this whole racism thing is coming out, at least from a social media standpoint, because like I mentioned before, I didn't know the things that Tyron was going through on social media. And that's something that I empathize with him a lot. And my heart goes out to him because the fact that they're, I'm not stupid. Of course, there's racism. Racism is is all over the world. But the fact that people are hounding this guy and saying this deplorable shit, it just, it sickens me. And, and I'm, I'm kind of glad that, you know, these people are now being outed. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, it's a little bit similar to yourself. I'm really happy that he spoke out about the racism stuff. I think it's something that's always sort of needs to be out in the open. I know there's a lot of issues all over the world with the racism, the stuff that's been going on in Chicago is just crazy and the, the stuff mm. in America and even here in Australia we really struggle with racism as well. And it's it's just really, and there's been a bit of a push uh, recently where, you know, racism has this sort of emerged itself. So it's really good to have a guy sort of stand up and uh, sort of be a spokesperson for that and be like, hey, th this is wrong. But when it comes to actually people disliking Tyron Woodley, it's just the fact for me, I've always thought he's just tried so hard to get everybody to like him. He, you know, we've seen him at open uh, workouts or he's told fans, hey, when I yell this, you reply with that. Mm. He's also tried to make big fights happen, but he's been really, really obvious about just wanting to do it for a big payday rather than just sort of, sneakily do it with uh, with trash talk like Conor McGregor. So it's like he hasn't really been building uh, those fights. He's just sort of like, hey, I want to fight uh, Nick Diaz because this is a big money fight. And pe yeah. I can see why that rubs people the wrong way because they're like, hey, you've just been champion for a minute. Before you do that, why don't you, you know, fight the next contender? Whereas if you would have gone another route and just sort of started trash talking Nick Diaz and not being so obvious about it, I think people would have been behind it a bit more, but he's just very obvious about the fact that he wants the big money fights and it's time for him to make more money, which I agree with. But at the same time, people feel slighted that the number one contender isn't getting a shot. And a, a lot of people sort of got rubbed the wrong way when he didn't really want to give Stephen Wonderboy Thompson a shot to begin with. So even with this rematch, with his draw, I think him saying that, you know, Wonderboy doesn't deserve the rematch and all that kind of stuff, I think that annoyed people as well. So there's a tall poppy syndrome going around in Australia. I know people don't like it when people aren't humble in a lot of ways. And I mm. think people love a champion who fights whoever's the best person. But then if it is a big money fight, then it's great. It makes sense. There's some trash talk there, some history there, and it comes or comes together organically. That's great. But the problem with uh, Woodley is a lot of the stuff that he does is really uh, pre-planned and not organic. And when stuff is pre-planned and not organic, fans can just easily see that. They can easily see through that. 
And I can just compare it to, uh, for example, the WWE. I know a lot of our listeners don't really watch pro wrestling, but the WWE, they create good guys and bad guys. And sometimes they really try and make people like a good guy. Like, for example, there's a uh, WWE wrestler called Roman Reigns. And for the longest amount of time, they've been trying to get everybody to like this guy, but it's not organic and everybody hates him. It mm. just goes the opposite way. And with Woodley, I, I wish that he would just let – he would just do what he does – and let people make up their own mind about him. That mm. way, you'll get a lot more support. But I've seen him in those press conferences. I mean, look, I've been a part of that press conference where uh, the stuff happened with him and Conor McGregor. And I asked him if he wanted to fight Conor. And then Conor, he said that Conor's not interested. And then Conor said he was interested and had to go back to him. In a lot of ways, you know, why don't, sometimes Willie well, doesn't really want to play along with the media. He doesn't really want to go there where, 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 where there's natural heat and fire or an organic interest. He just wants to push interest to whatever he's doing. Mm. So, and I think that t turns people off. I mean, for example, on social media, we've seen multiple times where, the, for example, the UFC might put something out or a fan might put something out and he's going, no, I'm not talking about this now. Let's talk about that. Or why are you promoting this guy when, when you know, I'm, I'm here? Why are you doing this and that? And I wish he would just sit back, do what he does, let people make up their mind about him organically. And not try and control what people are saying, what they're talking about, or what they should be interested in. I think that's probably something that really rubs people the wrong way. And it's not really racially based, but just on the fact of sort of how he's carried himself in the public eye in the, you know, in the last couple of years. I, I agree. I, I agree that he's kind of fighting two battles. Like even, even with this whole racism thing, I feel like he's, he's, he's going out on a limb here. And for that, I respect him because he knows mm. he's going to cop heat, right? It doesn't matter whether I agree with him or not. I, I respect the fact that he's going out here knowing that he's going to be, you know, copping bullets for his opinions and he's still going out there and doing it. But I, I wish he'd be a little bit more un unapologetic about it. Like, because it just seems like you're right. He's he's saying this stuff, but he's also trying to kind of keep winning fans over. Reminds me of, uh, you know, John Jones where there was that Lyoto Machida thing and you had Greg Jackson saying, win some fans, John, win some fans. And he's kind of, you know, doing one thing. He wants to be confident, but he's also trying to like appease the fans. And I feel like, man, Woodley, you need to just, you, you need to just do your thing and just go balls to the wall. Like you, you look at say Conor McGregor and uh, he, he's much like Ronda Rousey, much like Chelsea, is very unapologetic. You never hear Conor McGregor um, apologize, you know? And I think at the start, people are like, you know, who's this guy? But then eventually they sort of come around. They're like, man, just he's, he's so confident people get sucked into it. Same with Ronda Rousey, you know? She just never looked back and people sort of eventually jumped on the bandwagon. I think with Woodley, he needs to kind of do the same thing. You know, he, he shouldn't apologize for what he's doing. He shouldn't try and tiptoe. He shouldn't say things like, I went through something. And it was, it was to do with racism, but I'm not going to talk about it because I overcame it. No, talk about it. I want to know if there's something that happened and it was racist. I want to know if, if you know, I, I, I'm not opposed to getting on his, if you, if you tell me like, Hey, a UFC exec or something or someone from a company didn't want to deal with him because it was race. Like I'd like to know. And then I can empathize with him and say, all right, you know what? You're right. This is something to do with, with race. But I just, I, I just don't see how there's any correlation between the way his career is or, or many other fighters are. And, uh, you know, and, and, and anything to do with race. So, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's also sometimes like when he does interviews with people and talks about his opponents, you, you get one perspective from him and then he sort of flip flops and goes to another perspective. Like, for example, everybody saw the ESPN interview that he did with uh, Stephen Thompson mm. and he said all this stuff to Stephen, like, like he was annoyed with him about all this stuff. But then you see them uh, doing interviews and then he's like friends with Stephen Thompson. Then he like, then he's not friends with Stephen Thompson. Then he's got these issues with Stephen Thompson. Now he's back back to being friends with Stephen Thompson. And I think the thing about Stephen Thompson, why he's got so many fans is in all those situations, he was just the same. Like he had the same opinion. He just stood up for what he believed in. But sometimes with Woodley, he, he, he just sort of flip flops on guys, changes his mind about them. Sometimes he has a problem with them. Sometimes he doesn't. And even with, with the whole Michael Bisping thing of how he sort of built towards this fight, but all along he knew he was fighting uh, Stephen Thompson. I mean, like, and he announced it on his podcast. I mean, that kind of stuff does rub people the wrong way. And if people admit to, oh, hey, by the way, I knew I was fighting this guy all along, but I just wanted everybody to talk about this. Sometimes fans that click on all that kind of stuff and talk about it, they can feel a little bit stupid. Like, hey, I, I believe that you actually wanted this kind of fight. Or I actually thought you wanted that kind of fight. And if you knew you were fighting this guy all along, I kind of feel stupid now because I was in my friendship circle going, no, 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 he really wants it. But all along you were mm. sort of trying to build hype for yourself and for your brand. I just, 
if you say, even with Chow Sonnen, he says ridiculous stuff, but when he says it, he sort of believes it, and then he sort of sticks to it mm. for that moment. He doesn't stick to it. He sort of goes back to another thing, and it just doesn't let fans trust him sometimes when he says stuff. And I think if you don't have the trust of fans, if fans can sort of, can't sort of trust what you say, if they think, oh, hey, this guy might just be saying it because he wants to rile up interest in himself, but it's not actually going to happen – I think it's really, really tough, tr- uh, tough to win that trust back and rebuild that trust. And I, I think you got to be, you have to be organic about it. And if you decide you're going to go in a certain way, don't expose it straight away. So yeah, I, I think I think, and just I guess to sort of deviate, one of the biggest mistakes that I feel like MMA fighters make, they kind of try and take the whole pro wrestling route and and set up mm-hmm. a rivalry. Everyone's getting it that all right, rivalries are what sells. I'm going to use it to set up fights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for God's sake, don't tell people that you're doing it. Yeah, like like have you ever heard Conor McGregor say like? Hey guys, I was just fucking around. Me and Jose are friends. We were just doing it. You you know you don't hear that, you know? Where if he talks, mm. you know, incredible trash talk about um about someone, whether it's vulgar, offensive, whatever, you never hear him go back on it and say by the way, guys, it was just to get your money. It's insulting to the fans and it insults their intelligence. Same with Chael Sonnen. Mm. You saw the things that he said about Tito Ortiz and, and Jenna Jameson. It was just, you know, crazy. Uh, it, it was really sort of, you know, over the line and, and vulgar. But And Tito Ortiz wanted that apology from him at the end at the press conference. He's like, that's it. You got anything to say? And Chael said, I, I told you happy birthday. I've got nothing to say. You, mm-hmm. you don't apologize. You don't go back on it because mm-hmm. otherwise people stop believing that it's real. And I kind of feel like you're right. Same thing with uh, with Tyron Woodley. Don't tell people that you're setting up fights. If you want to set up fights, by all means, do it. But, you know, do it. <laughs> don't, don't insult people's intelligence. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the UFC always say, it's as real as it gets. And just people need to be careful because the more, especially in this day of Conor McGregor, the whole WWE stuff and everyone always questioning what's uh, pre-planned or is mm. this pre-planned? Is this another WWE thing? You just don't want to expose the fact or, hey, I just said this so you guys would be interested. But really, this is the fight that was actually going to happen. So, I mean, that kind of stuff just upsets fans. And I think, and we see that stuff after fights as well. Oh, no, we're actually friends now. Yeah, it's like, no, it you're not. Yeah. You're not just friends now. Don't do that to yourself. So, mm. it, it, I mean, look, I'm excited to see what happens with Woodley. I definitely underestimated him in his last fight. I thought yeah. uh, Thompson was going to beat him. I, I know he says that he's one of the most underrated, underrated uh, champions in UFC history. I don't think so. There's been other champions, guys like Matt Serra and other guys who have big, been big underdogs. And I also think he just hasn't been champion long enough. You know, he's a new champion. Look at guys like Michael Bisping. Everybody thinks they're going to be able to beat Michael Bisping. Mm. There's a lot of champions that people have a lot of doubt in. So I think if he was a champion like Jose Aldo or even less, at least had a few title defenses, everybody was still deny, uh, questioning him. I think that's one thing. But I think he had a really good performance against Wonderboy Thompson. People are starting to come around to him, but... He just hasn't been champion long enough. Yeah, I mean, you know, even Stipe Mircic, I mean, he's a guy that's been doing well, but, you know, they just announced he's going to be fighting JDS at UFC. I think it's 211, 210, 211. And uh, a lot of people are picking Gini Dos Santos in that one. And mm. you know, just uh, before we get off this topic, I mean, I, I don't want to sort of keep ranting on it. Jordan Breen actually covered it really well and sort of went into the history of the UFC and how there have been a lot of champions that the UFC have treated really badly, um, such as Tim Sylvia, you know, Tito Ortiz as a man. Massive smear campaign there. Frank Shamrock, one of the originals, and um, Randy Couture, who could forget the UFC's treatment of him. So, I, I think I think that's the other thing when Tyron Woodley says that he's got blatant facts to back these things up. I mean, it's all well and good to say a blatant facts, but you got to show him. You got to. He says he's got statistics. I mean, that's all well and good, but I need to hear them. I need to hear what these facts are, right? Because I'll I'll happily admit that I don't know everything. I definitely don't know everything. And so, if there's facts that he's that he's sort of hiding. Um, and he can sort of swing, swing me and other people, uh, you know, to his way. I'm happy to listen, but if you're just going to say blatant facts, anyway, I don't want this to be sort of a, a, a segment where we rag on Tyron Woodley. I think you've covered it pretty well, Dennis. That we both respect Tyron Woodley. I don't know who's winning this fight between him and Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Mm. I mean, I, I really did think Stephen was going to win that first one. And uh, other than the fact that it was an amazing fight, I think Tyra improved an incredible amount in that fight. And um, I'm, I'm sitting really on the fence on this one. 
Yeah, and I have no idea either, so it's going to be exciting. UFC 209 is going to be a big, big card. But, Cass, we have some other stuff to talk about in the episode this week, and we have a, a special guest as well, don't we? Yeah, we're about to jump on the line. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying the show so far. Don't forget to hit us up with all your opinions, good or bad, at Submission AUS. And if you haven't subscribed, definitely do that. But as Dennis mentioned, we've still got a lot of things to cover in the MMA world, specifically the Russian MMA world. And, uh, Dennis, I believe our next guest is on the line. All right, guys, our next guest has been a longtime friend of the program. His Twitter bio puts it best as it describes him as a journalist exploring intersections of politics and sports. You can find him on his awesome work at Bloody Elbow, Sports on Earth, Open Democracy Russia, and other great websites as well. It's a pleasure to welcome Karim Zidane back to Submission. Right? And Karim, let me say Happy New Year to you as, as we welcome you to the program. Well, Happy New Year, Casper and Dennis. It's good to be back. As you said, I'm always uh, I'm always happy to be on the show, and it's always good to talk to you guys. So it's uh, it's great to be back. What's, what's well, there's new? stuff to there's stuff to talk about, and before we get to all the crazy stuff that's been going on in Russian MMA, we want to quickly talk about this Charles Sun and uh, Tito Ortiz fight, the Bellator 170. Kareem, real quick, I mean, it was last weekend. People saw this as a big moment for Tito, who was able to go out of the sport on top and with a pretty dominant win over a big name. What do you think about the fact Tito was able to go out out of the sport on such a dominant win? You know. Tito Ortiz has been like the the butt of a lot of jokes over the years. I mean, somehow he went from being like a hero back when, like in the early days of the the Zufa run, etc., mm. and like a big nemesis to the likes of Chuck 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 Liddell and even Dana White. And then he ended up becoming the butt of a lot of jokes. We thought he was going to retire years ago after going on this horrible losing streak. And what do you know? In the end of the day, he actually ends up being one of the few who gets the luxury of going out on a win. And finishing what is, in the end of the day, a Hall of Fame career and a legendary career. So say what you want about Ortiz Ortiz, and we might not agree with him on a lot of things. I mean, a lot of things. <laughs> but at the end of the day, he did what very few fighters do. Respect to him for that. Yeah, Casper, there's a lot of things I like about uh, how Tito went out, the, the opponent, the way he was able to do it. But there's a lot of allegations from fans right now all over the internet that believe maybe the fight was fixed. There was the point in the fight where people thought maybe Tito tapped. And then there was also the finish where the Rene choked didn't quite look as people are used to seeing it. And I mean, this is a situation where if you don't roll, if you don't do submissions, it can be quite confusing. What are your thoughts about those allegations that the fight was fixed from fans? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be honest. Like, I saw all those allegations, but when I watched the fight live, I never really for once thought it was fixed. It, it didn't really seem all that fishy to me. I, I kind of... I did expect Tito to win in this. I know a lot of people had, uh, you know, obviously Chael Sonnen as the favorite. I was a bit surprised that he didn't fight all that hard. But at the same time, when you look at all the factors, like the fact that he's a guy coming off not only a three-year layoff, but a suspension and a guy that's competing for the first time in a very long time, if ever, supposedly cleanly. I mean, we saw Chael Sonnen's body. He... Compared to what he looked like in the UFC, it was night and day. Um, ring rust is a big factor. So the fact that Tito went in there, you know, dominated him, and, and Chael Sonnen didn't really look like himself, it didn't really surprise me. Uh, if you look at Luke Thomas's breakdown, he sort of describes and, and sort of shows why Chael Sonnen was actually wise to let go of a lot of those submission attempts. So it kind of dispelled those myths. The whole tapping from Tito... It's a fight. I don't think anything is really that black and white. It never really seemed fishy to me. And then as far as the finish, the sort of re-naked choke that was kind of in there, but kind of not. I mean, Chelsea's face was turning purple. It, it looked like he was in a lot of pain. Um, I, I don't blame Chelsea for not being 100%, and I, I don't really think there's anything fishy about it. And not to mention... Why would Chael Sonnen go out on a loss? Why, why would that benefit anyone? It doesn't benefit Chael, and it certainly doesn't benefit the company in Bellator for the guy leaving the company to uh, promote himself and uh, to sort of, you know, put down the guy that, that's essentially an investment in Chael Sonnen who's got another six or, or five fights left. So I don't think it's a fix. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it would be the worst booking move in the history of, like, pro wrestling or MMA. It would just make absolutely no sense. But, mm. I mean, a, a couple of factors there as well. People forget that uh, in a lot of fights, Charles Sonnen um, does sort of look for a way out once he gets hurt or the fight turns around. We've seen what happened in the Rashad fight. We saw what happened in the John Jones fight. We saw what happened in the second Anderson Silva fight after he tried to throw that spin spinning back fist and fell on the ground. When he does end up in difficult positions, we have seen him sort of I oh, know, not not give up, but so look for a way out here and there. And in, in this situation, when he was on his back, and uh, Tito did land a couple of those good 
elbows, you could see that sort of happen. Also, I believe that Tito is incredibly strong and that kind of grip mm, strength. Mm. And when you have a crank like that, I don't know if anybody that's listening has been in a, in a crazy crank before, but I have had some bad, bad, bad mornings waking up with, with people half Tito's size cranking on my neck. So, I mean, I do not blame uh, Sun and Adolf for tapping. Uh, Kareem, quick, quick question. I mean, the Bellator really seems like they invest a lot of money and time into Charles Sun. And how much has this hurt him, the fact that Sun has now sort of lost this debut it was relatively quick and it was against the guy who's now retired? I mean, it's not a good look, which I mean, at the end of the day, this is exactly why I agree with what both of you are saying as to why this is not a fixed fight. It just simply doesn't make sense from a booking standpoint. I mean, anyone with any sort of wrestling knowledge would tell you that would be a ridiculous move. But it, it, Chael Sonnen is one of the rare fighters that can sort of expunge, or not even expunge, but sort of uh, bring out that fickle side of MMA fans where as soon as he starts trash talking, you put him in a fight against Vandele Silva, say, mm. up next. The trash talk and the tension between those two should wipe away some, some of the memory of the Tito Ortiz fighter. If anything, really, it might make it more competitive. Some who would have said that Sonnen would have beat uh, Vandele Silva easily might say now this is a more competitive fight. He's one of those rare fighters just because of his trash talking in general and the way he sells fights that he'll be able to bounce back at least for a little while. Now, I mean, let's think about it, really. Chael was was hit at his most popular right after the first Anderson Silva fight, which he lost. Mm. So he's able to take these things and turn them around in his favor. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. And not only that, but then the second fight that against Anderson Silva that he also lost, he followed that up with a run on the Ultimate Fighter, a wildly successful run against John Jones, and then faced John Jones. He lost in the middleweight division, went up a weight class, and fought for the belt at a higher weight class. So I, I agree with you, Kareem. If anyone can do it, I think it's definitely Chael Sonnen. I think even though he lost, he's got sort of an easy excuse, you know, the fact that you know, he, he, he did have that massive layoff. And uh, I agree, you put him up against Vandalay Silva, he, he he loses zero steam. And I think if they're smart, because the question is, do they do it in Bellator, that do they do it in Rising? If they're smart, they will do it in Bellator. Because while it would be fun to see Chael Sonnen go over to the land of the rising sun and create a bunch of mischief, he shines best uh -huh. when he's got a lot of media, a lot of a lot of cameras and a lot of microphones in front of him. I just don't see the, the you know, the usual MMA media outlets heading all the way over to Japan to cover a Ryzen fight, whereas if they do a Bellator and it's somewhere, you know, in California or, or you know, Kentucky, Texas, Tennessee, wherever they go, San Jose, you're going to have all those usual big MMA outlets, and uh, that's that's probably the best way to promote the fight. So I, I don't think Sonnen really loses much at all, ne and neither does Bellator. And if people want to see an example of Chael Sonnen being able to turn things around, watch one of those first episodes of The New Celebrity Apprentice where Arnold Schwarzenegger was set to terminate him. And then he turns things around and an innocent person in the boardroom gets fired. Alas, I think Charles Sonnen was now fired in the latest episode, but it's a good <laughs> example of Charles Sonnen using his Jedi powers to turn things around. All right. Anyway, Kareem, we're always happy to have you on the program and love finding out <clears throat> the latest news about the Russian MMA scene. And there's a few things to talk about. So as we turn the floor over to you, let's start with Fedor. I mean, we were just talking about Bellator. He has a big fight with Matt Mitrion. It's coming up soon. But are there any other updates you can give us on what's going on with The Last Emperor? Well, let me tell you this. I'm a little worried ahead of this fight more than usual mm. for Fedor. Now, this is a, this is against the usual points about him being an aging star, etc. And basically what we witnessed when he fought Fabio, Man Fabio Maldonado, who was a gatekeeper at best, really. But all that aside, this is the first time that I sense that his actual job, being the president of the Russian MMA uh, union, is actually not interfering with his work, but it's an added load that's making it difficult for him to actually dedicate himself full-time to fighting. Now, this is just my personal analysis, and I say this because mm -hmm. he only started his training camp, I'd say, 10 days ago, something wow. like that, just early around the first week of uh, January, well, past the first week of January, close to the second week of January, because by the time January came around and he was done with his actual duties, which was several different fights and traveling to many different locations for the MMA championships, etc. By the time he actually got home, it was Christmas time because he's Russian, Russian Orthodox and they celebrate Christmas on January 7th. Being a very religious man, he's going to be at home. He's going to be with his family. So he doesn't start training camp until the week after that. And now take this. According to his coach, he's only going to be in 
the United States five days before the fight. So I don't even think that's enough time to truly acclimatize. He's an aging fighter. I mean, I've done those trips back and forth from North America to like from North America to Russia. I'm telling you now, it's not an easy trip. Mm. I'm 25 years old and I struggle with it. So I can imagine Fedor coming across right after a training camp. Mm, I'm a little worried, to be honest, guys. What do you think? That's a lot of great insight. Um, I, I, I certainly didn't know that. I think a lot of the listeners didn't know that. So uh, we, we definitely thank you for, for your honesty there. I'm wondering what you think happens if Fedor loses this fight. Because I think this is kind of a pick em one. I can definitely see Fedor winning you know, in, in various scenarios. The fact that you've just said what you said. Uh, you know, certainly hurts that. I can definitely see Matt Mitrione winning. I mean, if Fabio Maldonado was able to hurt him, I can see Mitrione hurt him. And some people are saying that if Mitrione is really dominant and sort of destroys Fedor, maybe it's the last time we see him. What do you think about that? No, I don't think he retires just yet. I don't see that sign or him sort of hinting it in interviews the way he was doing in the past. What I do think would happen is, and this is just, again, my, my, my opinion here, I think he'd, he'd be due for one more fight with Bellator. The money's good from what I understand. He's happy with the, with the contract. And it's a multi, multi-fight multi deal that he signed, but it's not an exclusive deal. So that's key. So if he does choose to just have one more fight, it won't necessarily be a Bellator fight. It would definitely be in Russia. I can't envision Fedor, unless he gets seriously hurt, in a fight and is forced to retire out of circumstance, I do not think there's any chance he retires anywhere but in Russia. So say he has, say he loses and he possibly has two more fights in him. He'll have one more in Bellator and he'd have one more in Russia. That's my personal opinion. And I think he's, I think he's interested in doing a few more fights because he seems to be enjoying himself. When you watch him in his interviews, he's smiling, he's happy. And it doesn't seem like he's bothered with what he's doing. I don't sense that he's doing this for the money. I mean, you've had me on here before, and I've tried to describe what I understand of the Fedor uh, psyche when it comes to him and wanting to fight. And this seems to be his joy. I mean, he's got his job. He's secure with his money. He's part of the Russian sporting elite in Russia. And, I mean, he's got he's loyal to Putin in that regard. And that, I mean, is always beneficial in Russia. Mm. And uh, it's... I think he's very comfortable. If he chooses to fight, it's going to be a personal choice that he wants to continue. And if he's, if his body's saying no, depending on what happens in this Mitrion fight, he could well he could very well retire. But again, I really do believe he'll save himself for one big farewell in Russia. Because I mean, think of his last send off in Russia. Putin was there. His it was in front of his home crowd, and they could say like "Thank you, Fedor," etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, he hasn't been fighting too much in Russia lately. I mean, at the end of the day. People still love him. He's still the most popular fighter in Russia. Khabib is very, very close, second place, but still, 100%, it's Fedor who's the most popular fighter. Mm. It's crazy because uh, Bellator 172, obviously, he's fighting against Mitro, and that's February 18th. We're, we're here now on January 25th. That's so literally less than a month, and you say he started training 10 days ago. I'm just wondering, obviously, that doesn't bode well for anyone, but do you know normally what Fedor's training camp is like? I mean, people have always sort of wondered, like, he, he trains in Stariaskol, but people have always kind of wondered what a typical training camp looks like for Fedor. Is he one of those guys who sort of re- relies on, on, uh, on, on natural talent? We remember in Pride, there were times where he sort of came came in with like, you know, that that sort of line down the middle, not quite abs, but like, you know, sort of like leading into abs and people are like, wow, Fedor's in crazy shape. <laughs> what does a normal training camp sort of resemble and, and how long does it normally go for? He's changed a lot since when, since prior to his retirement when he was part of M1 Global and there was a Red Fury fight team and he had that group of fighters around him. So let, let's, let's make this a little more relevant and I'll explain his training camps mm-hmm. uh, since his, his second coming, basically, of uh, Fedor. So when he first returned, the first thing he did for his first training camp, he dedicated three months before his fight in Ryzen. What he did was before going to Stario School, he went to the Netherlands and he trained in the Netherlands. But he took his group of fighters went to the Netherlands and hooked up with certain uh, kickboxing coaches. And honestly, I can't remember who, who they are right now, but they're not necessarily the most famous uh, kick, kickboxers you can think of in the Netherlands. But, uh, or else I really would have like, the name on the top of my head right now. But mm. that he spent about three weeks there, and then he returned to Stario School with his group of fighters, and uh, baby, like Baby Fedor, Kirill Sedilnikov, and uh, Anatoly Tolkov. Very specific Slavic-Russian fighters that he considers the future of uh, of Russian MMA. 
And that's his group of fighters that he trains with consistently. He still trains with the same head coach, Vladimir Voronov, the same person who's been with him throughout his win streak that is still his head coach, although he's been dealing with uh, illness lately. He was in and out of hospital. So the assistant coach, again, is still another person who's been with Fedor for a long time. So there haven't been <clears throat> necessarily many changes in Fedor's uh, training camps. The thing is, they were always longer than this. This is definitely yeah. the first time I noticed that he's only dedicated a few weeks to a training camp. And that's worrisome. I mean, if he wins, it's going to be a haymaker quick early finish in that regard. I just I worry for what happens after that. Wow. Well, I guess I guess it's questionable whether we're going to see a, a big wall between these guys. Um, all right, let's let's move on. There's there's a lot of interesting things to talk about. Things that <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of our listeners may have no idea. So we're going to be counting on you to enlighten everybody. Um, there's this story about Ruzal Mirzaev. No idea if I've if I've come even closer to his <laughs> name, but basically he got shot. Artem Lobov was involved, and it, it was sort of obviously not in, not as in Artem Lobov shot him, but he was he was there. Uh, I believe Rusal was showing Artem a good time, and it, it was around or based on an argument about Conor McGregor and Khabib and those kinds of things. I'll let you sort of piece the pieces together because you did an article on this on Bloody Elbow. Tell us and tell all the listeners what what exactly happened. What's the story here? So before people freak out on Artem Lobov, yeah. he wasn't necessarily involved in any, in any of the shooting itself, or he wasn't around when, when Rasul got hurt, yeah. but he was there the day that sort of sparked everything. So it starts to, during one of the, the fight night events, uh, Artem Lobov came over with one of his fighters that was on the card, like he was cornering someone who was on the card, and Rasul Mirzaev, who was one of the top featherweights in, uh, in uh, Eurasia fight nights in Russia, and uh, he, he, him and Ali Bagomatinov, they showed them a really good time, basically, in Russia. Mm. And, and that, that was basically because Artem had shown them a good time in Ireland when they had visited for a UFC event like prior at some point. It, it's, it's a complicated story in that regard. But the, the, what's really important is obviously the Russia trip. So they go out to this uh, nightclub. And that was like part of their, their night out and having fun. And Artem meets these two different uh, basically Dagestani uh, me like men who tell him, like start talking about like Conor McGregor, Khabib Nurmagomedov. But he says, and he told me this via email, is that it was a very civil conversation. What he didn't notice was afterwards they had an argument with Rasul Mirzaev over the same issue because apparently they, were, they had a problem with Artem. He just didn't know it. And they punched Rasul in the back of the head. And then he, ha he came after them punched one of their people, and then they all left the club. But obviously that had triggered something, because three days later, Rasul Mirzai was attacked in his home. He was shot with what they call a traumatic gun. Now, mm -hmm. I honestly can't think of a different word for it, but it's basically a really high-powered BB gun that's capable of penetrating skin towards the organs, basically. So it can wow. kill you. It's unlikely to, because he was shot. He claims Rasul like now in interviews claims he was shot 18 times but he dodged most of them Jesus. so i mean with a real gun you're not really going to get sort of that luck mm. but four different bullets at least hit him and several in the head so his face was swollen and he, they had to remove these bullets from his face but at the end of the day he managed to live through it basically and a couple hit his chest but wow. he couldn't and then what what they proceeded to do it's not like they just shot him and left him what they proceeded to do was beat him with a baseball bat and then one of the two men tried to choke him with a big chain. So they were mm. trying to kill him. But in sort of the mess and of things, they got too loud. They were worried people were going to show up. And he says they simply le they, like, they robbed the house and left him, thinking he was either dead or unconscious. He lived through this. And he managed to identify one of the, one of the men. They have not been arrested yet. But basically, this is another example of just the sort of trouble you can get into in Russia. And it all can all start off something as small as a discussion about Conor McGregor and Khabib Nurmagomedov. Now, Artem Lobov has like no responsibility in this story whatsoever. Mm -hmm. He was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. And Rasul Mirzaev, let's be honest, he has a bad history with nightclubs. This is a man who went to jail for manslaughter. <laughs> and he went to jail for manslaughter for punching a 19-year-old boy in the head outside the club in a fight and that boy fell over and 
hit his head on the pavement and died. Mm. So at first he was supposed to go to jail for murder. Then because of a manslaughter charge and having already been in jail for a certain period of time, I think it was 16 months, he was released. He was basically, they said he's innocent. This was an accident, it's manslaughter. For some reason, they let him go in Russia. And he's free to go and he's free to fight in Russia. But this is the sort of thing that's going to keep him out of the UFC. And once again, lo and behold, he's in trouble because of a nightclub incident. So, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't look good for Rasul Mirzaev in nightclubs. Wow, what a crazy situation. <laughs> And it's, it's just wild when you bring up this kind of stuff because people who live outside of Russia don't really realize some of the stuff that goes on there. So mm. very, very interesting story, Kareem. Now, uh, before we let you go, we have a lot of people obviously discussing Donald Trump as of late. He is now the American president. And also a lot of people discussing the UFC's ties to Donald Trump. Obviously, Dana spoke at one of his rallies. There was a relationship between the two since the UFC was allowed in the Trump Taj Mahal Casino a long time ago. However, in your latest article on sports, Politica, you brought up the fact that earlier this week, Donald Trump selected WME IMG Chief Financial Officer Chris Liddell to oversee a new think tank called the Strategic Development Group. The decision to hire the Hollywood power broker executive looks to emphasize the increased ties between the White House and the Ultimate Fighting Championship even more. Talk to us a little bit about this news and what can really mean from a political perspective. And also, is Chris Liddell just Chuck Liddell with a mustache? <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris Liddell is actually from a New Zealand native originally. So, oh, I mean, nice. I don't know if they're related. It's something quite distant in that regard. But uh, back <laughs> to the point here. <laughs> the w WME, IMG definitely has their hands in all the right places it seems with this new presidency and the ufc is in a position they've never been in before and this might sound like good news for a lot of mma fans but i'm here to tell you exactly why this isn't now first of all the dana white's ties to donald trump aren't news i don't think i need to go into them in much detail you did that very well <laughs> just a minute ago but uh, he did openly and happily proclaim himself a donald trump guy and speak at the Republican National Convention. And that's not an insignificant move for the UFC president. Again, that sort of loyalty is rewarded. Now just think of Vince McMahon and his ties to Donald Trump, mm -hmm. and now Linda McMahon is part of Trump's team. Loyalty is rewarded in Trump's White House, and he asks for that sort of loyalty. Now the UFC will, will have its different advantages. Now think of, think of these different points and tell me I'm not crazy to be worried here. First, you have Ari Emanuel, one of the most powerful Hollywood brokers, and so, well, honestly one of the most powerful men in America, when you think of who his brother is and his different ties and just the amount of businesses he owns, he gets a meeting with, with Donald Trump shortly after he was elected president. Now, <laughs> you have to be quite something to get one of those meetings. We don't know what the meeting was about. We don't, it doesn't have to be about the UFC. In fact, I highly doubt it was about the UFC. It doesn't have to be. But a few weeks later, Ari Emanuel and Dana White go to Russia. They go to Russia and they don't just meet with television producers or, you know, venues, etc., to set up events. No, they go to the Kremlin where they meet the deputy prime minister, Vitaly Mutko. Mind you, the man who is, by many claims, partially responsible for a lot of the Russian doping scandal. But that's another mm. problem for another time. <laughs> just think about that sort of sway when you can just be a foreign entity, a foreign sports promotion that can suddenly enter Russia and meet with Putin's inner circle. <laughs> meet with Putin's inner circle. And this, this UFC group that arrived there both have ties to the Trump administration. Now, <laughs> I'm not here to make assumptions on anything, but... Everyone can connect the dots here and see that we're, we're about to enter a new phase of sports diplomacy with the UFC as the medium in play right now. Donald Trump can use the ultimate fighting championships and cage fighting, A, to endear himself to a certain portion of his supporters that are already likely, based on demographic, to be part of that part, like to be part of his fan base and to be ultimate fighting fi champions uh, supporters at the same time. Attending events will almost endear himself to that crowd the same way attending a basketball, day, a basketball game endeared Obama to his fans.
But that's almost the most innocent version of what Trump can do. At the end of the day, sports like that, and especially this is something, having been someone who studied Russia and Russian like politics and how and these many different Central Asian uh, klepto kleptocracies and authoritarian regimes, all of them use sports, A, for state prestige and to enhance their personal image and that of their country. Now, in many cases, they choose masculine sports because that's what endears them to their, A, either conservative or B, to simply more machismo uh, supremacist style supporters, mm. which is what they get in a lot of these different areas. Now, Trump, people could say, well, in general, why would anyone want to side with a niche sport that's basically regulated violence? That's a bad image. Has Trump done anything traditional so far? Mm. Would this really be the most uh, controversial decision he makes if he shows up in, at a UFC event? Is that really controversial in comparison to him uh, signing the gag order again just yesterday? Yeah. Is, is it any different? I don't understand. Uh, is it any different? It isn't. So people who think that this is impossible, this is unlikely to happen, should think again. 100%. He's about to take this sport and make it his own tool to A, connect with certain people and B, enhance his own personal image and C, potentially, potentially connect and use it for diplomatic ties with Russia. You can call me crazy, and I'm sure certain followers will say so, but this wouldn't be the first time this has happened. This wouldn't be the first sport chosen, and this is only history repeating itself. Wow. I mean, it's just an, an amazing story to, to, to talk about. And, and Kareem, I'm just wondering, in, in your mind, how soon do you think we'll, we'll start seeing some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of movement, movement in that area? Do you think it's something that's going to take a while and it's going to gradually happen? Or knowing Donald Trump and some of his movements, do you think one morning we, just, we can just wake up and see some of these things happening before our eyes? I think it could be either a low profile moment or similar to what other White House uh, administrations have done, have done in the past, use certain sports moments to, to basically get a bump in the ratings at the, at the right times you need in your polls or your polling, where you need certain approval ratings at a certain point. Small little gestures can be very useful. So it could be something completely taken by surprise. Three days in advance, you'll know Donald Trump is coming to a UFC event. You'll have to know in advance because of security, uh, what's, uh, what's it called, the Secret Service, uh, etc., and all the setups they'll have to do. There's no way something like that will be kept secret. It will leak, that sort of information. So you'll know a few days in advance before a UFC event. Or it could be something that they broadcast and want a lot of people to know. Donald Trump, the new U.S. president, the person who is giving America back to the people, the person who is now proclaiming the Nazi slogan, America first. It's <laughs> let's like, I mean, really, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is he's, he's easily going to do the, these sort of gestures as, as a sign of look, look at me. I can go and attend these events. Look at the sports I like. This is what I follow. This is what I enjoy. He's going to use golf to endear himself to the elites as well, as he's, as he's done historically. He has lots of golf courses. You know how many deals are going to be made on the golf courses? There's going to be many of them. And that's another form of diplomacy right there. Whilst Obama participated in baseball diplomacy as, a, as an attempt to, uh, to end the embargo and enhance ties with Cuba and show the common ground that the United States and Cuba have, he used basketball to... Uh, as a symbol of a, his, his background, his racial background, and B, just to endear himself to certain people. Both, it's, both were very harmless. Whatever Trump does with golf, which A, by the way, they can lower the wages on golf courses based on his upcoming policies as well. So anything he does in golf or in ultimate fighting and basically in general UFC and any sort of uh, combat sport, be it boxing, any of those things, it's going to be toxic to those mm. sports. And those who support it are not really thinking long term at all. It's actually funny you say that because on the way to UFC 205, we were making the flight from Australia to uh, to New York. I was watching some some stuff on Vice on the plane, and there was a, sort of a Vice episode, and they were doing a, a thing on one of Donald Trump's golf courses where it was about the conditions of the workers, and they were basically treated like slaves. People, you know, 20 people in one room, and uh, they were the people building Trump's golf courses. But I guess that's a separate thing. You mentioned, obviously, the UFC and, and Dana White and Ari Emanuel heading down to Russia. Just before we let you go, Kareem, just wanted to ask if, if you've heard anything, if you know any updates on, you know, what, what the deal would be about a potential UFC event in Russia. It's been spoken about for a very, very long time. There was sort of 
I guess, murmurs, sort of things from Dana White and, and other things about, you know, hey, maybe we'll do a, a big event in, in, in Russia for Khabib Nurmagomedov. Obviously, he's fighting Tony Ferguson in Vegas. But what do you think? Do you think 2017 could be the year with, with these meetings that maybe you'll see UFC in Russia? I, th- I You know, I, I was convinced, especially after uh, the, what I just mentioned about them meeting with higher up Kremlin officials within, in, in part of Putin's inner circle. Mm. I was thoroughly convinced that that was going to be the case until they decided to make a move and try and leverage more cash for the TV rights. So Match TV, which is the biggest public broadcaster for sports in Russia, Mm -hmm. had the rights to the UFC. Now, I learned from sources that the UFC was being paid $500,000, $500,000 a year for the rights to the UFC, Uh which is pennies. Yeah. Pennies. $500,000. And (laughs) this is, this is confirmed information. At the end of the day, uh, it was, it was a horrible, abysmal deal. But think about it, guys, the UFC is broadcast in the middle of the night in Russia. Mm. Who, who, the ratings aren't going to be great. People are barely going to be watching unless there's a Russian athlete. There's a limit to how much these Russian companies are going to want to spend. Think of the currency exchange. Think of the issues with the ruble and the falling economy in general and all the other sports they're going to be interested in and the World Cup coming up. The UFC is just not the biggest thing on, on, on the radar. So they ran into issues there. So what the UFC decided to go and do was to hand over the rights to a third party mediator who's going to shop things around. That mediator is Telesports and owned by a man called Peter Marakov, who's actually an advisor to Eurasia Fight Nights as well, which is a really, really interesting, bizarre circle we're about to enter. But likelihood is the UFC will find a home for its broadcasting rights, and it will be sometime in the near future. But the question is, did they choose to leverage this now because they know there's a UFC event coming soon to Russia? They want to change the deal beforehand? Likely so. But the but more cunning thing is, is that they did choose to do this so close to UFC 209, where they know Russians are thinking about Khabib Nurmagomedov potentially becoming the first Russian UFC champion. A big deal for Russians. That sort of pride is essential to them. And it... It's so definitely a good time to leverage it because there's, at, as it stands right now, nobody in Russia can watch the, the, the UFC 209 event unless they're illegally streaming uh, a stream from, I don't know, somewhere that's not Russia. <laughs> so that's, that's a, that was a big problem. So unless they figure that out, I can't imagine them going to Russia beforehand. But they come up with a big deal, then they're going to be there by the end of this year. It'll be late. It'll be late this year, October, I'd say, November, something around then. Well, and I'll, I'll be excited to see what happens with that. I, I was just laughing about the fact of, of Russians trying to find an illegal stream outside of Russia. Usually, we're trying to find a Russian illegal stream. It's the other way around. The shoes on the other foot. But Cream, thank you so much for your time and coming on the episode, guys. You can keep up with all Cream's work on Twitter at Zidane Sports. He's across so many different publications or websites. Cream, just quickly uh, for fans listening, is there something coming up that they need to keep an eye out open for? There is multiple things coming up, actually. I've got a long form on Fedor Emelianenko coming on Bleacher Reports and CNN. Mm. And actually, it will come up the week of his fight. So look for that. It's going to basically answer everyone's questions on why he never signed with the UFC. All that went down over the past decade, including the infamous island encounter. I've, sp- I've mm. spoken to many people for this. I've spoken to Vadim. I've spoken to Scott Coker. Spoken to many people for this one, so I think people are going to be very interested nice. in uh, what I've uncovered throughout this. So I think that's the pri- the primary thing that I want people to look forward to in that regard. Apart from that, I would like people to read more articles on my new venture, Sports Politica, which is a site basically dedicated to sports and politics, how they intersect, where they intersect. It's all independent journalism there. So I would appreciate people checking that out. Other than that, it's a pleasure as always to be on the show with you guys. That's right. Well, it's the pleasure is old ours, Cream. We can't wait to see that article and uh, check out what exactly happened there. And guys, make sure to check out Sports Politica. It's a, it's a great website, and Cream, you're doing amazing work. We just wanted to mention that once again. We always love your stuff. Thank guys, you. make sure to follow him on Twitter. His work is across multiple websites, and it's the best way to know what is going on. Uh, me and Casper, we can't wait to have you back on the program to talk some more. Cream, thanks again. Thanks, guys. Take care. And just like that, there goes Kareem. Another time, another great chat, another big load of insight into the Russian and European MMA world. 
I miss him already, man. I, I, I feel like we don't get Kareem on enough, and uh, I, I always love having him on. I, I hope you guys enjoy it, and as soon as he goes, I miss him already. Don't you, Dennis? Oh, man. I, I've been missing him. Even when he's on the show, I miss him. <laughs> I send him texts while he's on the program going, hey, Kareem, what are you doing? Oh, you're on the show. I still miss you, man. <laughs> now, it's absolutely beautiful having him on the program. I love his stories, and everybody needs to support him because he is doing something different compared to a lot of MMA journalists out there. He is digging deep to find out about these political ties and what's really going on and putting in a lot of work for that. So, and I mean, the stories are just amazing. So please follow him on all the different websites that he's on and follow him on Twitter. You won't regret it. But Cass... This is it. I mean, th this program has been amazing. We've had so many great guests, and we're coming to the end of it. I just want to quickly – I know we haven't done many movie reviews, and I know people are missing the Timothy Johnson mustaches. Oh my. I just want to quickly mention that I watched Assassin's Creed mm -hmm. in the cinema. And, um, my God, what a, what a steaming piece of shit that one was. <laughs> Jeez, that was – that was a really, really tough. Uh, that was a really, really tough movie to watch. Michael Fassbender is in it, and you're like, "Oh, Michael like Fassbender is awesome," but bang, it's terrible. Very, very bad. Drawn out, long. And I remember when I played the first Assassin's Creed game, I thought, "Man, this could easily be an awesome movie." Mm. I just don't. When you have the scenario there, and the scenario is good, I just don't know how you can go so wrong with a movie. I mean, I don't want to be a negative Nancy here, Cass, but uh, kicking off the year with, I guess, the first Timothy Johnson mustache review, I give this one half a mustache out of five. Oh, I mean, possibly one of the worst reviews I've ever given. It's just one of those things where not only did I, did I want my life back and my money back and just absolutely hated everybody that actually was in the movie after it, <laughs> but, you know, it was one of those things where the, the idea was there, the concept was there, and you could have done a really, really good series based on it. But again, Hollywood probably rushed it, crap script, uh, the actors weren't really right for it. Michael Fassbender, you know, he does a great job, he did a good job, but uh, it was just it was just painstaking. So uh, if you want to go watch Assassin's Creed, you know, maybe go sit on a rusty nail. Not only will you save money, but you'll have a more <laughs> enjoyable time. And that's my Assassin's Creed review there, Cass. Wow. Uh, nothing if not scathing. And I hear tetanus shots are cheaper than movie tickets these days. So so there you go. What you're saying basically is Michael Fassbender needs to go back to his day job, which is playing Magneto, right? Yep, that's right. Okay. And I'm excited. I'm so excited for the new Wolverine movie coming out, mm -hmm. Logan. So I'm hoping that, who knows, maybe they can figure something out in the future. Yeah, so there's a few fun movies coming out. There's Split with uh, McAvoy. Uh, there's some movie coming out with Ben Affleck, Live by Night, Alive by Night, or something like that. Unless you've already seen it and you've got a scathing review already percolating. And, uh, and then there's the Power Rangers <laughs> movie. So, yeah, the, I expect some fun ones from us uh, in the future. Yeah, that's right. I mean, look, I, I'm, I can't wait. And guys, again, if you have thoughts or opinions, make sure to jump on social media. Hit us up at Submission AUS on Twitter, facebook.com forward slash Submission Radio AUS on Facebook, and SubmissionRadio.com. A lot of you might not even know that we have a SubmissionRadio.com, but it's there. And we will have the blogs that Al will be putting up from his trip down here in Australia. We'll also be putting, up, putting them up on social media. But don't miss those because... No doubt about it. Al's going to have some interesting stuff to say. I'm very excited to see his take on Australia. And uh, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? So don't miss these blogs. Make sure to check out the website to check them out. Yeah, and also, speaking of Al, don't forget to check out his seminars. Wednesday the 1st of Feb, that's at Alex Cariotti's Gym in Hornsby. Friday the 3rd of Feb in Moorbank at the uh, Sinizic Parosh Martial Arts Center. Uh, and that's in the evening. And then Saturday 11th of Feb, UFC Gym in Alexandria. And that's going to be in the afternoon. So, well, like Dennis said, check out, obviously, SubmissionRadio.com for these blogs. Check out Submission Radio AUS. And uh, we'll have all the information, of course, Al's Twitter, at Al I Quinta. And uh, uh, there'll be a lot of fun partying with Al. Yeah, that's right. And just like that, it's another episode of Submission Radio. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Another big episode of Submission Radio coming next Wednesday if you're in America and Thursday and if you're in Australia. Remember, a bit of a time difference, a bit of a change of day when the show comes out. So just put it into your routine and we'll catch you guys same time next week.